Okay, good morning. It's uh, July the 26th, 2017. My name is David Laws. I'm a semiconductor curator here at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View. And this morning, I'm going to interview Jeff Tate about his uh, career in the semiconductor industry and learn some thing that we don't have a lot of uh, information on is the managing of a semiconductor company based on intellectual property. We've done a lot of interviews of people with fabs, so this will be it's, uh, an interesting avenue to explore, Jeff. So welcome, Great. Jeff. Glad to have you with us. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Thanks, Dave. <coughs> Let's start off with uh, your childhood, Jeff. Where were you born? Um, tell us a little bit about your family and what were your interests as a child. I was born in uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, in the middle of the country. Uh, my father was a land surveyor. My mother was a homemaker, both from Canada. And uh, I grew up oh, five, six, seven years it was in Winnipeg. And then we moved to Edmonton, which was a booming town at that point. It was 100,000 people, the center of the oil business. So my dad got transferred. And I spent the rest of my childhood in Edmonton, uh, in northern Alberta. Uh, so uh, my interest as a child, uh, I always liked sciences, math. That was the stuff I liked the most. Uh, I hated English, but I managed to get good grades. Um, and I always wanted to do something different every year. Mm -hmm. you know, paleontologist, uh, astronomer, it changed. And Where did I, the interest come from? Was it friends, mentors, reading? Well, I think my dad stimulated a lot of interest in the okay. sciences. My mom was always supportive of uh, school. Mm -hmm. and doing well in school. Uh, neither of my parents had completed a college degree. My dad dropped out during the war. My mom never got around to starting. But they both wanted us to get a good education. Mm -hmm. And they were happiest for us to do whatever, but my dad had uh, a strong math bent. A lot, there's a lot of trigonometry and stuff in land surveying, as it turns out, and I think encouraged my interest in that field. Mm -hmm. So when I uh, finally finished uh, high school, I went into uh, university uh, studying physics. So I thought I wanted to be a theoretical physicist and study atomic particles. But uh, you need a lot of calculus. I had a terrible calculus professor. So he turned familiar. me off. familiar. I can't blame the professor. Either. He turned me off. I still remember his name. It's funny how you remember certain <laughs> people's names. And uh, to him, everything was obvious, but it wasn't so obvious to me. I needed a little more yeah. help, I guess. Uh, but I was taking a computer science elective class uh -huh. and found that to be very interesting. So I switched into that and, and off, I, off I was and that eventually led into semiconductors. Okay. Now this was the University of Alberta in Edmonton? Yes. yes, yes. Up in Canada, everybody just went to their hometown university. Right. Uh, I don't remember anybody who went anywhere other than the local university. Uh -huh. Did uh, You had siblings, brothers, sisters? Uh, three. Uh, two brothers around my age, uh, and then a sister who was like 11 years younger. Mm -hmm. Did they have similar interests or in uh, sciences and math, or was they...? Uh, I, I think uh, sometimes whatever your older... I was the oldest, so whatever the oldest is good at, a lot of times the younger ones channel <laughs> away from that. That's an interesting uh, phenomenon, isn't it? <laughs> so I think uh, they might have done well in those fields, but... Especially my brother, one year younger than me, hated to be compared, so mm -hmm. he focused off on other things and became an English major and then eventually a lawyer. Uh, my uh, brother, a couple of years younger, uh, never did well in school, uh, dropped out and moved around, eventually became an English teacher, now living in China. And my sister uh, studied nursing. Mm -hmm. So we all ended up doing very different, different things. things. Sure, sure. Did there uh, was there any school teacher or other mentors that uh, encouraged your interest in science? You, you said your your parents did, but was there, were there other influences that helped you in that direction? Oh yeah, but I, I can't say I remember all of them vividly. I do remember a uh, uh, a math teacher in junior high school who actually got me involved in a after-school program where we could use computers at the university, mm -hmm. which was really a good deal. Uh, I forget his name, but uh, I remember when I was studying, he was, very, he was very good. There was a science teacher in junior high school, whose name I forget, I can remember what he looks like, who similarly I liked a lot. And then in uh, high school, <clears throat> there was a teacher, uh, uh, Mr. Radomsky, uh, who was 
really got me interested in sciences and especially physics, which mm -hmm. is probably why I went into sure. physics originally. Okay. And in physics at college, did you study much in the se semiconductor technology? Or was that the oh no? I dropped out of physics and moved into computer science, like in the first ah. the first half a year. Got it. So why did you do that? Oh, because of my calculus. Because of the professor. calculus. Right. Got it. Right. And the computer science. I had actually been learning about computers through this university program where we mm -hmm. could do programming on our own. But I just found the computer stuff to be much more interesting. Mm -hmm. And perhaps the thing that I liked about computers was that it was easier to do things and get stuff done sure. quickly. Much, it's much more tangible. You, yeah, you touch study, something and get a result. Yeah, atomic <laughs> particles, you need some gigantic <laughs> reactor. Bureaucracies sure. are involved. Right. It takes time. You know, computers, uh, back then you had to do punch cards. It wasn't instant, but it was way faster turnaround time than a lot of other things, mm -hmm. and I like that. What kind of machine were you working on? Uh, well, the, at the start, well, when I, when I did the, uh, uh, the program that involved me going down to the university in high school, uh, it was an IBM 1130 mm -hmm. that had uh, APL. Right. among other languages, but APL was the re really cool one that we loved to use. Um, in university, it was an IBM 360 mainframe, mm -hmm. and I think we programmed primarily in Fortran, if I remember right, Probably at the start, anyways. Watt 4 from the University of Waterloo. And, uh, but then pretty quickly, I got involved with, uh, somehow with the computer, a PDP-11 running Unix, mm -hmm. and learned how to program C. And I think that was just kind of open and available and sitting there, and I just started to do it and used it as my programming tool of preference because it was instantaneously responsive, and I like the C language. And then, so you graduated in 1974? I did. And your next move was to where? Uh, I went to Harvard Business School. Okay. Uh, I don't know why I didn't follow on in, in graduate stuff. Uh, I don't recall anybody ever encouraging me to do a PhD or a master's program. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I sort of think back and I wonder, well, how come I was so focused on going to business school? But I'd always been interested in the, the business side of things as well, or maybe not always, but somewhere along the line that interest developed. And I applied to two business schools, my local university and Harvard. I didn't know about any others. And I got into Harvard, so off I went. Was there any particular direction you pursued at Harvard in, in, in business? Uh, <coughs> no. Harvard has a general program. There's very few electives. Okay. So as I recall, there was a few electives in the second year. The first year is all prescribed. And it's only a two-year uh, routine. And I didn't actually know anything about business. As it turned out, uh, I may have been in the last year where they actually let people go into Harvard without work experience. Because hmm. not having work experience made a lot of the classes somewhat, you know, especially I remember organizational behavior classes, and they talk about dysfunctional behavior in organizations, which is, <laughs> you, you, know, you, 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 come, you come to realize how these <laughs> things work, but... When you've never worked in an organization, it's right. like, no, people wouldn't really do this kind of stuff, would they? So, you know, so a lot of it wasn't that. It would have been better if I'd had work experience. For sure. But on the other hand, I'm not sure I never, ever would have bothered going back to school if I'd had work experience. True, true. Yeah, how did you find anyways. Boston after Edmonton? It must have been quite a change of uh, scene for you. Well, Boston's, um, not a lot of people go to Edmonton as tourists. You know, <laughs> Boston's a much more fun place and the weather's a lot better. Right. And uh, compared to where I'd spent all my life, other than one trip to Disneyland as kids where we got to see uh, Western U.S., which was a lot of fun. I'd never really been outside of Western Canada. Mm -hmm. So Boston, you know, just seemed like a really old place. 400-year-old uh, graveyards and old buildings and just lots of people. It's really a college town on a large right. scale. And uh, so it was, it was a lot of fun. It was very eye-opening and very interesting. I, Did you get to use time. computers at all in the, the business curriculum? Hmm, I don't recall that we ever used a computer hmm. in the business curriculum. At, at Harvard, some of the mentality was that they were focusing on developing general managers. Yep. And you could hire people to do <laughs> accounting, like finance, that. computers, right. you know. The program was really focused for general uh -huh. management. 
And then when you graduated from there in 76, I believe, you uh, started to look for, now what do you do with these skills? How, di how did you uh, make a choice? Uh, well, it was easy because uh, nobody wanted to hire me in the United States. Uh, being Canadian, I didn't have a visa. There was one company that interviewed me and made me an offer, and it would have been consulting in the IT space, uh -huh. somewhere in Alexandria, Virginia. So I seriously considered that, but in the end decided it was much more of an IT job than it was a, a business job. Mm -hmm. So I ended up going up to uh, Canada and working at Imperial Oil, which was the uh, U.S. and still is the U.S. subsidiary of Exxon. Mm -hmm up in Canada, you know, a, a massive company, but they gave me a job in marketing, which was more along the lines of what was, I was interested in doing. And where were they located? I, I wasn't interested in working in the oil business, right. but in Canada, there wasn't a whole lot of things to pick from. Sure. Uh, so that seemed like the best choice at the time. And where was the, the offices? Where were you located? I was at their headquarters in Toronto, in Toronto. Canada. So another big city? Another big city. Well, Toronto is a nice place too. Yes, it uh, is. It doesn't have... You know, Boston's, I'd rather live in Boston than Toronto, but mm -hmm. Toronto was diverse, good food, a uh, lot of interesting neighborhoods, a lot of immigrants, uh, so it was a pleasant place to be. And uh, what did you learn about marketing? Um, at the time, I'm not sure I learned that much. <laughs> in retrospect, I'm sure I could have been a lot better, you know. Um, that's why at my startups I try not to hire people out of school. <laughs> they, they really haven't learned what they need to learn yet for the most part. But it was a training ground and what they were really doing in this program is to identify talent for future promotions. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I remember a couple of marketing programs that were being explored at the time. One was like a talking pump, you know, a pump that would have audio-visual feedback. Uh -huh. Okay. It seemed like kind of a silly idea at the time, and <laughs> probably still was. Another one was convenience stores. Uh -huh. And in retrospect, it's like, it's, well, that was an obvious idea, but, <laughs> right. but at the time it seemed like a really dumb idea to have a convenience store uh -huh. at, at a gas station. And what did I really know about cars? I didn't even own, own a car. You know, I wasn't a car person. Yeah. I had friends who were car nuts. So it was really kind of an opportunistic place to go to learn more about the business world. And, it, it clearly, from the start, wasn't likely to be where I was going to spend my career. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Did you ever get to see any ideas that you had come up with uh, put into action? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. I had to implement uh, marketing programs, and uh, these, these are retail point-of-sale programs for promoting certain things. And mm -hmm. I had to uh, fly around the country and train people and work with real service station dealers. And, you know, so it was hands-on. So this was your first real experience of business? Uh, we, we and some, my, myself and some friends had done some business stuff as hobbies, you know, buying and selling things, janitorial services, but uh -huh. this was the first time it was a This was when job. you were back in Edmonton? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this was the first full-time job with any real exposure to business with, you know, where you were in meetings where they were talking about the long-term plans and the strategic decisions and the financial forecasts and capital allocations and all those kind of things. So mm -hmm. it was actually a, a well-run company with a lot of good systems and procedures sure. and processes. So I think I learned a lot more than, than they got back in return at the time. And did you get a chance to observe organizational dysfunction at all in that, that role? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, all organizations have dysfunction. Right. You know, once, once you're past two people, you know, usually it starts to develop. Sure. Um, and this was a gigantic company. It was an $8 billion business back then as part of a $100 billion business. Mm -hmm. So there was just layers and layers of bureaucracy. Um, for its size, it probably was fairly well run. It was probably less dysfunctional than average for a company its mm -hmm. size. Mm -hmm. But I remember at one point I got promoted to a, uh, uh, I forget, a, a marketing, the senior marketing level or something. So I got an office. But the guy on the other side of the wall was in an office, and he was more senior than me, and he complained that his office was smaller than my office. <laughs> so they actually came in one day and took down the hard wall and moved it so that the offices <laughs> would be regulation size, okay. <laughs> which seemed like a really stupid idea. The stupidest thing was that at the time, the phone jack was, was mounted on the floor. 
So, so now my phone jack for my phone, and I was in marketing talking to people across the country, was located on his side of the wall. <laughs> so I didn't have a phone for however long it took to install a new phone jack. Fascinating. So that, that was an example of a really stupid thing. Yeah. You know, that yeah. I remembered deciding that uh, big companies weren't really my thing even then, and that uh, a lot of silly stuff just... There's a lot of things that you wa companies mm -hmm. waste time and energy yeah. on. Style was more important than getting results in big okay. companies. <coughs> any use of computers in that job? Nope. I do not remember any computers mm -hmm. or any use of computers. There, there was computer programs. There right. was an IT department. We'd get reports. Sort of accounting, financial yeah, stuff. Yeah, but they'd show up like in the daily summaries or, or things like that. Mm -hmm. There was no terminals. There was no programming that was done. Uh, well, whatever the computer was, it was probably some big mainframe somewhere, somewhere else in the building, spitting out reports, and right. those would get distributed around. Mm -hmm. And how long did you spend at Imperial? I spent a little over, around two years. Mm -hmm. I uh, did my marketing stint, then I got promoted to a, what they call a, a financial and operations coordinator, supporting the regional sales people in uh, Western Canada, back in Edmonton, as it turned out. And uh, they were going to promote me again to an area sales manager, uh, but at that time I'd uh, already taken three weeks vacation and toured around the U.S. It was time to find uh, a job in high tech. Mm -hmm. And uh, <coughs> who did you uh, target for your visits? Uh, I don't remember all the names, and probably half of them are gone, or probably more than half of them are gone. <laughs> no. Uh, I went, I took three weeks vacation, I, I know I went to Southern California, I talked to a board company there, I talked to a printer company in, in Els, no, no, in the valley north of Los Angeles, because I remember being very surprised that you could drive for so long and just see nothing but people in buildings. Um, right. I uh, talked to uh, advanced AMI, AMI in, in uh, the Bay Area. I talked to Advanced Micro Devices. I talked to TI. Uh, I talked to somebody out in Boston. I can't remember who. I was, I think, in Atlanta. Uh, so I was all over the place mm -hmm. in three weeks. Mm -hmm. And I'd cold called a bunch of companies. Uh, I remember talking to, on the phone, Bill Davidow, who later was the chairman of my board, right. uh, who said, no, we don't need anybody like you. <laughs> He was at Intel at the time. Right. So I had to cold call, I cold called a whole bunch of people. I got three weeks of worth of interviews set up and the interviews would usually go like, wow, this is great. We could really use somebody like you. And I'd say, well, by the way, I'm from Canada. I'll need a visa. And it was like, oh, well, there's the door, you know, <laughs> don't waste our time. Uh, there's only one company that ended up needing somebody bad enough to consider getting me a visa. And that was? And that was advanced micro devices. Okay, interesting. Now, were you married by now? No, I'd met uh, the person who had become my wife, uh, but we were just dating at the time. Okay, and she was in Toronto? We were... uh, she was in Edmonton. Oh, okay. My wife, Colleen, and she uh, uh, came down after I did get a job offer. Fortunately, it took six months for them to get me my visa, because my job was for a product marketing engineer, and my actual degree was computer science. Right. Uh, AMD at the time needed somebody who understood computer architecture. And in my computer science program, I didn't study semiconductor devices. I, I studied digital logic, mm -hmm. but I understood computer architecture and could draw multipliers and adders and state machines and all that kind of good right. stuff. I couldn't draw a transistor or explain how it worked because I'd never taken any courses in that. Uh, so the U.S. government got a little hung up on the fact that I was getting a job as a product marketing engineer and I didn't have an engineering degree and that made the visa process take six months instead of one month. What, what AMD should have done is called the job a, a, a product marketing computer scientist and, and right. I would have gotten the visa in, in a month, but my then wife, you know, maybe our relationship wouldn't have developed uh, enough. So okay. it was probably good that it took six months. Interesting. So this, she came down later and ended up getting a job at AMD also. Right. AMD was growing very fast at the time, and she had IT skills and got hired into the IT That's group. Right. It only right. took her one month to get her visa. <laughs> so this was, uh, I believe, 1979 when you joined AMD in Sunnyvale? Yes, 1979. And who did you work for? I worked for John Springer. For John? 
And uh, basically, what, what was your role working for? John was product marketing manager for Bipolar Microprocessor, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. And uh, John had been marketing the AMD 2900 bit slice family for some period of time before mm -hmm. I got there. Mm -hmm. And I think I was his first product marketing engineer. And he would have been looking specifically for somebody with some computer architecture skills to talk to customers about architectural stuff and also perhaps talk to the internal group that was working on new products. Uh, so I worked for John for about a year and then John moved on to the Z8000 mm -hmm. uh, uh, CMOS microprocessor that AMD was doing in competition with the 8086 and the 68000. Um, and then I ended up re reporting to you. Dave. That's, that's right. That, that was must about 1980, I, think, I would I guess. I think it was 1980, for, although or so. my ability to remember dates is <laughs> <Mine too>. I'm <laughs> is glad I had this cheat sheet in front of me <laughs> that you prepared for me. I, I don't remember it. working for John for that long. So uh -huh. I think it was around a year into the job that John moved on and I'm, right. I started reporting to you. Now it must have been quite a change of culture coming from a multi-billion dollar company in Canada to uh, advanced micro devices in, in Sunnyvale. Did, were there surprises in the way the company worked and the way you got things done? Uh, so long ago, it's hard to remember. Uh, but, you know, compared to Imperial Oil, it was a small company. Yep. The headquarters was two-story building. Uh, you know, my job was in uh, one of the smaller buildings, two, it was two stories. It was a relatively small campus. Uh, just the Canadian operations of Exxon was probably ten times bigger than Mm -hmm. uh, AMD at the time, right. but AMD was had been already gone public and probably had a thousand employees. Well, a lot of those employees were manufacturing folks. Right. The actual professional staff of degreed people probably was just in the hundreds. Mm -hmm. So it was a company that you could sort of get your arms around. You could get, end up meeting and knowing most of the, you know, uh, management team uh, in a fairly short period of time. And I, and I like that. I like the ability to get a bigger picture of what was going on. Sure. <coughs> you know, my, the managing director who ran the group, you know, the engineers reported to, to him, the, uh, the, the, the fab operations, I'm not sure that we had our own fab, probably not, but the fab operations yeah. was, in, it was very close by. So everything was close, everything was touchable. Right. You know, if you needed to find people, you just had to you know, go go down the hall or maybe a couple of blocks and everybody you needed to work with and make decisions with was very readily available and approachable. Who was the managing director you were reporting to at that time? When, when it was John Springer, I don't remember who the managing director was. Would it have been Phil Downing? I think it was, yeah, now that you mentioned it. And then yeah. McConnell came in later. Uh, yeah, and, and, and John East. And then John East, yeah. right. Was McConnell the managing director? Of I think he was in 2900 one time. Okay. I know he was the design manager. Maybe you're right. <laughs> yeah. I, th I think he was the design manager reporting to John. Okay. If I remember right. And then later he became managing director. Correct. Okay, that was after that. Yeah. And uh, what was the job of a product marketing manager with the, in the bit slice microprocessor business? What, what did you do? How did well, you spend that, your that time? Was, that was after John moved on. Uh, I forget when I became product marketing manager. Maybe it was when I started reporting to you. Maybe it was after. But uh, at that point, mostly what I recall doing was doing a lot of, uh, well, A, they were supporting the, uh, the sales guys in the field. There was, there was a lot of pricing, delivery issues. Uh, the order's <coughs> late, needs to get expedited, uh, allocation of uh, parts if there was uh, over demand. Uh, scheduling a backlog. There's a lot of that stuff. There's a lot of stuff on pricing. What prices should we quote? Uh, we were the majority supplier, but there was some competitive versions of some of the devices that we made. So sales guys would be talking uh, in the morning, it'd be Europe, in the evening, it'd be Asia, and the day it'd be all over the US. So there was a lot of talking and supporting customers on pricing decisions. So that was the tactical uh, aspect of the marketing. In terms of market development, uh, there was writing data sheets. Uh, I remember the first data sheet I wrote was for the, the 2960, which was an error correction device, which I'm not sure why that was in the bipolar microprocessor group, but uh, 
could be anywhere, but anyways, I, I, I got to write a long uh, uh, data sheet there using the help of the applications people to uh, figure out how this stuff worked. And, and back in those days, data sheets were very detailed. Uh, customers basically wanted to know how everything worked inside and what the critical paths were and what the timing paths were, et cetera. So uh, that was my first data sheet. Uh, we did more data sheets than later because there was a lot of new product development. There was a DSP family. There's the 29116. And then there was the marketing. I remember uh, getting the cover of one of the major magazines for the 29116 was a big deal. Uh, writing articles, getting articles placed, uh, talking to press and editors about new products and announcements. Uh, and then uh, we did a lot of uh, uh, seminars. You know, these days uh, there, there isn't this kind of stuff, but back in the old days, uh, the way a lot of people learn things was to go to seminars that companies would hold, the company would hold the seminar in two or three hours on some new product line and the sales guys would pack the room with interested customers. And we did, I think, like uh, a couple of different seminar series and we'd hit like 30 different spots around the world, me and the product marketing engineers that worked for me. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the best ways we had to stimulate new design activity. Now, the 2900 was interesting for AMD in that it was one of the first real proprietary products where you had to actually go out and create a market rather than just try to defeat a competitor's price or service or quality or something. Mm -hmm. uh, did you find uh, salespeople needed a lot of training in order to change their style of selling and even the people they would call on to sell the product? I think the 2900 itself, the original 2901 family, had already, the market had been developed okay. by the time I got there. Got it. So what I remember was uh, the follow-on products, the 29116 and the 29500, which ultimately weren't as big a deal because CMOS was starting to make inroads into mm -hmm. the processor arena. Uh, so I was involved in the marketing development of those products. Yeah. But I think John and whoever else had worked with John, John Mick and so forth, had developed right. the market for the original bit slice. So the groundwork had already been laid and the, the, right. the sales force were pretty supportive, as I remember, by the time they realized that there was some real benefit to have a unique product in the customer's uh, portfolio. Yes, so I wasn't there during the transition from commodities to uh, having the first proprietary product. Mm -hmm. But uh, the salespeople, for the most part, spent their time selling commodities. And sometimes the, one of the challenges was to get the salespeople to pay attention to the proprietary products because they were paid on a commission scheme and proprietary products require a design cycle, as you know, and that design cycle you don't get any money for up front. You have to do the work now and you get commissions a year or two. In a lot of cases, it's easier for them just to try to go get commodity business in the short term. Mm -hmm. So that's why we would do things like seminars and articles and advertising because then you're not solely dependent on the salespeople to right. win the designs. And this was a time when I think AMD invested a lot of money in the field applications engineering force as well. Were you involved with them? Oh, yes, extensively. Yeah, they were probably the most fun people to deal with because mm -hmm. they usually had a lot of interesting technical challenges and issues and you know, listening to them and their customers and trying to figure out how, how to help solve the customer's problems was one of the most interesting parts of the job. One of the differences again in the kinds of products that were coming out when you were there was the customer expected a lot of support in terms of software, um, compilers and other tools. Were you involved in helping to identify those? And Promote them? There was no software in the products that I was involved in. Mm -hmm. uh, for the Z8000, those kind of products, they had software Wasn't requirements. Wasn't there the development system for the 2901? There was a development system. Right. That had already been largely canned and developed. Got it. So I w it was something that I hadn't been involved with. And uh, there was an applications engineering team uh, under John Mick who handled a lot of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So there was like a parallel organization inside the company run by uh, Sven Siemensen and yes. John Mick. And they provided application support at the central level for various product lines, including ours. So the applications people who developed things like the, uh, the, the development systems didn't work for the business unit the way it was set up. 
So I don't recall being involved in the development systems issues or mm -hmm. decisions. I think it was either all done at that point or it was done in the applications group. Right. So what was your next move within AMD, Jeff? Uh, at some point I got promoted to run the, uh, oh, what was the name? It was the board group, the multibus board group, mm -hmm. which had been a separate subsidiary company, AMC and was absorbed because AMC was partly owned, I think, by Siemens. Siemens, yeah. And at some point that fell apart. And um, the company owned now all of it, this AMC group, and it had another name, which I can't remember right now. And somehow, I don't remember the details, I ended up becoming the managing director of this multi-bus board group, which mm -hmm. was not doing very well but it was my first chance to be a general manager. Uh -huh. And how did that work out? Um, it was a learning experience. <laughs> <laughs> it, was the, it was the first of many you know, turnaround opportunities in my career. Right. So the group had more than 100 people, and up until that point, the most people I'd managed directly was five. Right. Um, so now all of a sudden I had 100 people reporting to me. And these hundred people weren't all very happy to see, you know, me show up to be the managing director. Uh, it's hard to believe with all this gray hair, but back then I was a young <laughs> whippersnapper. Right. Was I was like 29 or something. Uh -huh. And I think they were all hoping that somebody would come in who was like some, you know, Greek god of business with a proven track record, not right. somebody who'd never run anything before. Uh -huh. So I remember a lot of envelopes under my, my door. Uh, uh, in the old days, people would resign, resign by putting an envelope under the boss's door. Right. <laughs> when the boss wasn't around, and you'd come in and you open your door and you see a white envelope and somebody else was quitting going somewhere else. The, the business uh, w was multi-bus boards, which, which was something Intel had started as a, as a business line. And the thinking had been, I guess, that, hey, we make semiconductors and we make processors, why don't we make boards as well? Mm -hmm. Sort of an extension uh, downstream. But the board business was very different, and the customer base was very different, right. and I think that was the biggest issue. Is, you know, I remember going to places like uh, uh, mill, Mills, uh, Mills that made uh, like fabrics in South Carolina. You know, these were people who never buy semiconductors. Right, right. So it was strategically, it was, was probably had been a bad idea from the start, uh, and the company was losing a lot of money on the products. We had a manufacturing line, in, in the building in which the offices were. We were building and shipping a lot of stuff. The revenue wasn't bad, but the losses were, I think, as big as the revenue was at the time. Mm -hmm. So we worked on promoting certain products, cost reducing others, introducing new stuff, uh, and we ended up getting the business to a break-even point, as I recall. But it became pretty clear that it was never gonna make a lot of strategic sense. Mm -hmm. The company, it wasn't synergistic with the rest of the company. What became very clear to me after about a year was the synergy wasn't there. If the synergy's not there, well, why bother doing it? Right. Um, and I didn't want to waste my time doing something that didn't make a lot of strategic sense. So uh, I recall recommending that we sell the business unit, mm -hmm. shut it down or sell it. But I figured, you know, we got the break even, we could probably sell it. And we ended up selling it to some company that was in the bo board business in uh, oh, Champaign Urbana, mm -hmm. uh, Illinois. So they bought it, so we got something for it. We got rid of all the people and, and the businesses, and uh, and at that time I expected to leave the company and go do something different, but uh, I ended up staying because they moved me into another job. And what was that? Um, I, I think since it all happened fairly quickly, uh, if as I recall, I had the choice of two jobs. Um, there was a business unit doing bipolar PALs, and there was a business unit doing uh, ECL gate arrays. And it, maybe those were the same business unit at one point, but they had made a decision to move the ECL gate array business unit to Austin. So I think I temporarily ran the, the PAL group, mm -hmm. but for a very short period of time, not long enough to really even figure out exactly what a PAL was or how it worked. Um, and I ended up taking the ECL gate array job more because at that point, our family was growing and we needed to move from a townhouse to a house and the cost of houses was even then steep in the Bay Area and after going down looking at Austin, uh, 
it was like, wow, you know, we could buy like a mansion in Austin. Right. So, so we we went with the Austin location, which meant okay. ECL business unit. Uh huh. About when was that? Oh, I think I think I took over uh, the the board group in '83. So I think it was it was '84. '84 or so. I, okay. I, I think it was like within a, a little over a year after I took the board group on that we uh, ended up selling it off. Because I remember we moved down to Texas in late 85, early, you know, it was early 86, just mm -hmm. before our uh, second child was born. Okay. So I think I ran the ECL Gatorade group in the Bay Area for about a year so, and before we ended up moving. So, so it was late 84, maybe early 85, something like that. And I was uh, uh, paired up with an engineering guy, Dave Pedersen, you know, who I ended up uh, having a great time working with. And we were, uh, all of a sudden I found myself managing a business unit doing uh, gate arrays in, with, in bipolar, uh, high-speed gate arrays for mini computer companies, which was kind of fun because I remember working on mini computers like PDP-11 and PDP-8. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Now all of a sudden we had a chance to sell chips to people like Data General. I think the work had already been done by Dave to establish the first customer and maybe it was Tandem Computers. Uh, but we ended up going on to win business at Data General, Honeywell, Tandem, HP, maybe DEC. Okay. Uh, but I remember Data General was the program I remember the most. Right, it's a relatively narrow market, but if you can get into it, there's some good revenue to be generated. So, yeah. Again, a different kind of market than most of AMD was servicing in terms of it's uh, basically a custom product you build for a specific application. Yeah, this was back when ASICs were starting to become a hot item. LSI Logic in the uh, in the CMOS space was mm -hmm. was a hot company. So this was ASICs, but in the uh, bipolar area, uh, which would end up being not a long-term good business. But at the time, you know, the company was strong in bipolar, and so this was an area that we had an opportunity. And I think we did sell a lot of company products to these companies, mm -hmm. but we were selling memory devices to them. Right. Uh, bipolar memories and so forth to these companies. So there was already a strong business relationship and a belief that the company AMD was a good supplier and they gave us an entree to uh, do business with them in Gatorades and they were looking to have somebody other than Motorola who was largely the, the, the giant in this space mm -hmm. to give competition both in performance and cost. Right. Now you were in Austin, uh, you didn't have your own fabrication area, did you? You were basically subcontracting that out to another. Yeah, I never ran India. a I never ran a fab, and we started off in in Sunnyvale, but I knew from the start we would move to Texas. Um, and actually, initially they said, "Well, we're going to move you to San Antonio," because that's where the fab was right. for these products was in San Antonio. But I quickly reached the conclusion that Austin would be a much better place. That in terms of recruiting engineers, in terms of just personal wanting to live in Texas, mm -hmm. I'd rather be in Austin. I thought it'd be way easier to hire engineers to move to Austin. Right. Uh, and it, that turned out to be the case. I eventually we moved all our engineers from San Antonio to Austin later on. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, I, but I said, if I'm going to move, it's going to be in Austin. Okay. So we were the only bipolar group up in Austin. Um, all the others were down in San Antonio. And the cities weren't that far apart, so right. it was a 90 minute drive. So I never had a fab that reported to me. I never managed a fab in my career. The number of times I've been in a fab is, I can probably <laughs> count on my fingers. Sure. How long did you stay in Austin? Uh, we were there around four years. Mm -hmm. So a lot happened. Uh, uh, we had our first child in Sunnyvale but we had our second child shortly after we moved to Austin and our third uh, and last child was born in Austin. And uh, I, I went through several more career changes while in Austin. So mm -hmm. it, was a, it was an interesting time. Uh, we liked our time there, uh, but we ended up moving back to the Bay Area as, as you know later. What were the changes, career changes while you were in Austin? Uh, when we moved down with the ECL Gatorade Group, uh, I remember very tough year after we moved because only half the engineers wanted to move. <laughs> but we were in the middle of programs with customers. We had something mm -hmm. like 80 different 
Gatorades that we were contracted to do. To do. So I, I remember down, being down on the test floor myself, you know, debugging stuff, uh, working issues, working super long hours because we just had a shortage of people until we could hire the talent and, right. and train them, which we eventually did to get back up to speed. So somewhere after about a year after we got down there, um, I ended up uh, also getting responsibility for the 29,000 that was, microprocessor, that which was, was the, an MOS, which was my first MOS product in the mm -hmm. RISC processor space. So back in the late '80s, uh, RISC processors had become hot and interesting, and everybody was doing one. Just like in the early '80s, everybody was doing a 16-bit processor. Intel had won that race for the most part. So now there was a race for uh, uh, RISC processors, and would RISC processors dethrone x86? And if so, who would have the best risk processor? So the 29,000 business had been going for some time, but uh, I don't even remember who had been running it before, but for some reason they asked me to take over running the 29,000 group while continuing with the Gatorade. We promoted Dave to be the, the managing director of the Gatorade group, mm -hmm. and he continued to run that while I spent most of my time on the 29,000 products. I think, and somewhere along the line, I ended up with all of the bipolar uh, products as well. Hmm. Uh, what what was left of the bit slice uh, efforts? Uh, I think the things were already starting to go down in terms of demand. Uh, we were doing a, a 29C01, I remember a CMOS yeah. version of right. the 2901. But integration, you know, is is the way to go with CMOS. So, uh, lots of little pieces just wasn't the way to, to build anything anymore. So that business was slowly phasing out, and uh, uh, I spent most of the effort on the 29,000 because it seemed like that was the area that could have substantial upside. Mm -hmm. I remember meeting uh, Chuck Geschke at the time uh, of Adobe. We won a big design win for laser printers. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't build laser printers, but they did the reference designs that yeah. most of their customers used. So winning the reference design meant you were going to be designed into most of their customers' laser mm -hmm. printers. And we ended up winning a lot of designs for the 29,000 in uh, products like that. Uh, not computers so much as uh, things that needed computing resources embedded right. in them, like an embedded processor. Uh, the 29,000 over time, you know, didn't end up becoming the big winner. Uh, there wasn't, you know, but then Spark and these other things ended up not being the big winner either because the x86 never got dethroned. And the x86 stayed with the PC, which was the, the, the big win. Right. And things like Spark got, a, got into certain workstations and so forth. So all of the risk processors ended up as niche products in certain areas. You know, maybe good size niches, but the x86 never was taken over by risk at that period of time. So, um, and then at some point in time, I also got responsibility for the x86 business unit. So and now, okay. now is, and, and a whole bunch of MOS miscellaneous products back in Sunnyvale graphics and so forth. So now I had all the bipolar logic, what was left of it. And, and at that time, I, I basically took all the people off the bipolar. And that was when we moved from San Antonio. I made a decision that we should bet big on cloning the 386. Mm -hmm. And um, well, when I took over the x86 business unit, uh, I, I sort of had a history of getting business units that, with problems, <laughs> you know, losing tons of money or whatever the issues were. Um, but there were challenges. So the x86 business unit's problem was they were making we were making huge profits on the 286, but the 286 was going away because the 386 was coming out. Mm -hmm. And Intel had refused to, under a licensing agreement, send us the mass set for the 386. A minor problem. <laughs> and there was a whole big litigation that was going on, but I wasn't involved in litigation, thank God. Uh, but I had to figure out what to do with the x86 business unit. My predecessor was about to sign a deal with Chipson Technology where we would pay them over $100 million. I remember meeting Dotto at the time, a smart guy I kept running into over the years, and Dotto uh, was a smart guy, but the deal he had was very unattractive. It was 100 million bucks, we'd get to be a second source for a product which was not plug compatible with the x86, uh, and we would have no derivative rights. So they had their own processor? 
They were had to develop their own processor. Ah, I forgot that. I knew they had all these peripheral chips that they were selling. Yeah, okay. well, they were they were trying to figure out what to do because chips and technologies can see they were going to get integrated out, so mm -hmm. they're going to compete in the processor. But as long as the 386 was sole source, there was a willingness to consider a non-plug compatible product. Um, but the business terms were so unattractive. I said, well, for 100 million bucks, you know, there must be something better we could do. Right. Hopefully, hopefully, there's something better we could right. do. So one of my team members, uh, Ben Oliver, came up with the idea of, hey, well, why don't we clone the 386? We have the patent rights, unlike anybody else. The reason Chips and Technologies couldn't do a plug-compatible product was there was some patent to infringe, uh, something about the cache. And there was something about microcode as well. Microcode or cache, or right. there was some issue where yep. why you couldn't do it <coughs> pin-compatible. So Ben said, well, we have the patent rights, nobody else does, and he said, I think, I think we could reverse engineer it. So I didn't hear any better ideas. And the profitability of the 286 was so high compared to everything else we did. And the potential, if we can make the 386, if we can make the 386, it would be so much more profit <laughs> for us than anything else that I was right. responsible for. That what we did was shut down everything we were doing in San Antonio on bipolar CMOS, you know, 29C01, 29C116 canceled all that stuff, moved all the engineers up to Austin, and set up a team under Ben of about 60 engineers in a locked room with you know special key entry so that it would be, um, what's the term? You, you want to have the, the people not exposed yeah. to X80, other secret, trade secrets. So we took people who, for the most part, hadn't ever worked on the X86. Clean room or something Clean like room, that. Clean room, that was yeah. it. Yeah. So we took all these bipolar guys who never worked on X86, so it was clear that they weren't bringing in anything that had been learned from Intel, but really Intel never sent anything other than mass sets as far as I knew, so I'm not sure there was a big issue anyways. And we set up a room and basically they, they delaminated 386 devices and took photos, went down to the local Walmart and got them developed and slowly pasted up on the wall. <laughs> the 386, all the metal layers, and started tracing and building up a model of a 386. And then uh, got code to run through it, and eventually convinced themselves that they had by building developed up a model. This was a computer simulation. Right. Of the, of you needed a net list. Net, right. So they figured out the, the net list for the 386, and we were able to even we it wasn't me. You know, I never did any of the engineering in any of these projects. But Ben's team figured out how to put in some special modes for laptops, for sleep modes, and so forth, which turned out to give us a competitive advantage over the Intel 386 and laptops mm -hmm. later. And uh, <coughs> they ended up uh, building a 386, uh, which was, was completely compatible. Was there a name for this product? Uh, we had two projects that were going on. One was Longhorn and one was Lone Star. Uh -huh. mm, I, I can't remember which was which now. The other one right. was a 286 with all the peripherals integrated. Got it. Which we ended up building, but it, you know, the market had moved to 386 at yep. that point in time. So the 386, uh, uh, actually came out after I had left AMD, but it worked first time, or pretty close to first time, and got AMD back in the x86 business. Mm -hmm. And part of the reasons that the risk processor business never took off was that we cloned the 386, and now there's a second source for x86 devices, and, and you know, companies like Intel and, and others, and, and, and you know, I should say Microsoft, had plans for Windows and porting it to some right. risk processor. But once there's an x86 second source, it's like, hey, it's just way easier mm -hmm. to support one processor and have multiple sources. So that was a big, uh, a big turning point in the processor business. But we were doing it, uh, <coughs> you know, at the time because it seemed like the best next step. Right. And what what I wanted to do as a step after that is do the same thing with the 486. But I remember going to a meeting with uh, Jerry and the management team and presenting a plan. Now this was before we had the 386 out. We didn't have it out yet, uh, but I believed it was going to come out and it was time to start working on the next step if we were mm -hmm. going to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, just having the 386 isn't going to get us anywhere. We, we need to be moving ahead. And what I was convinced was that we had to develop value-added versions of x86, otherwise it's just a straight second source we'd have no strategic relationship with customers that would mm -hmm. give us any stickiness. If we could develop things like 
modes for laptops, maybe certain customer groups would come to view us as a strategically important supplier, not just somebody who would knock 30% off the price. Right. So we want to do this, I want to do the same thing with the 486, but I remember at that meeting, my, my mental recollection of that meeting at this time was half the management team said, well, what's the 486? And the other half said, that's just for mainframes. And, yeah. you know, go away, don't bother us. <laughs> at, at this point, AMD really didn't even have microprocessors as one of its three key areas. I remember in the late 80s, the th strategic thrusts were telecom, yeah. And there's two others. But processors wasn't one of them because... Probably EEPROMs or something was a major... Yeah, flash maybe. Right. Just because there, there wasn't a clear path in the processor business, so processors yeah. wasn't really listed one as the strategic, strategic, strategic focus areas. And we hadn't built the 386 and there a lot of skepticism whether this idea that I was working on would ever work. Okay. In fact, not just a lot. There was a huge amount of skepticism <laughs> about this among certain quarters. So the willingness to do 46 wasn't there at the time. Uh, eventually, the company did get into processors by buying uh, next gen, next gen, and right. other other things. And that was for the Pentium. So the light bulbs came on you know, right. at some point that hey, there's a lot of money here, and let's go go on it. But they hadn't come on at that point. And frankly, after 10 years, I was starting to go hey, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to be CEO here ever because Jerry's not going to What was your position? You were senior vice president, I was senior VP. I okay. report, reported to Tony Holbrook, who was right. a great guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I enjoyed, actually, my time talking with uh, Jerry as well. Uh, Jerry, one and one was uh, a great guy to deal with. Sure. Uh, and because the processor group made so much money, I had a lot of one and ones <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, pricing and all this kind of stuff because yeah. it was important to the company's revenue stream. But I reported to Tony and spent most of my time talking with him, and 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 I enjoyed that. But I always I liked being a general manager, and I was at a point of okay, well, I, now I'd like to run the whole thing, mm -hmm. not just a third of the company. I'd like to f figure out how to run the whole thing, and I didn't see that likely that Jerry was going to retire any time in a reasonable time frame for me as a young young guy. You know, five years seemed forever, right? <laughs> and I figured Jerry'd be there a lot longer, when, and he was. And so I figured, well, if, if he's there, then what am I gonna do for the next five or 10 years? Mm -hmm. um, so I was already thinking time to do something different. And you know, frankly, I was always more of an entrepreneurial person. The reason I didn't do entrepreneurial stuff is I didn't have a green card until the mid 80s. Mm -hmm. um, and I liked being general manager, <coughs> but I envisioned that at some point be my own boss, I'd be a CEO. So what were you working on at, under, at AMD then? If you didn't have a green card, you were... Oh, well, the, the process then was the same as it is now. Right, okay. Uh, you, you come in under, uh, I forget what you start as, but then you go to an H-1B visa. Okay. And once you get your H-1B visa, it's fairly mechanical to get to a green card. Okay. So I the came green straight card. in on a green card, so I somehow missed all Oh, really? Oh, well, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> you must have better Some lawyers. magic touch somewhere. <laughs> so, no, I had to go through a lot more stuff than that, uh -huh. and so did Colleen. So it wasn't until the mid-'80s that we got a green card. And with a green card, then it would be easy to move around to other companies. And sure. actually, I had quit AMD twice before. Um, once with the, the with the board group, I just figured, you know, hey, we should sell this, and I'm going to quit and go do something different. Yeah. And they promoted me instead. There's another time when I when I quit, and they promoted me instead. Did you have alternatives to go to when you quit, or you were going to go out? And no. Okay. No. <laughs> you just needed a change. <laughs> no, I never worried about the uh, short-term security issues, and my wife right. was always very supportive. Yes. In Silicon Valley, security comes from you know, being good at something. Yep. And Absolutely. there's so many opportunities, it's like you're not going to starve on the streets. Um, and I had a, f a strong sense of company loyalty. I was not somebody who was going to go spend a whole lot of time working on something else uh, rather than putting my efforts into the company. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I worked hard at what I did, and I didn't have time to do a whole lot of other stuff uh, besides family and work, that, w right. that was it. Was Colleen continuing to work in IT while you were in Austin, or was she? Uh, uh, Colleen actually ended up uh, in, uh, there was the IT group 
was centralized, so there wasn't really anything in Austin. Mm -hmm. So when we moved to Austin, she got a job, and maybe she'd gotten a job already. She'd already gotten a job working for Don McIntosh. Okay. Um, in fact, she she ended up being the product marketing engine product, sorry, the product engineer for the twenty nine sixty, one of the products I'd written the data sheet right. yes. for at some point. Right. She really liked that kind of stuff, and so when we moved down to Austin, she ended up in the telecom group. Mm -hmm. And actually, she got to use a lot of her uh, software background because they did have software things. There's ISDN chips they were working on. She ended up working for Georgic uh, Manassian, who she really liked. And Georgic's now off doing his own startup, Crossbar Memories. Mm -hmm. But back then, he was in telecom. So she worked all that time. And then we moved back to the Bay Area. Uh, she actually interviewed for several jobs. Um, AMD, for some reason, didn't have an opening. I, I don't know why that was the case or she wasn't interested in what they had available, but I remember she had a job interview with at Cisco, and mm -hmm. she talked to one of the big guys there. Uh, I wish I remembered his name offhand. And and decided, uh, the salary's too low, the daycare costs are so high, I'll just stay home. But we probably could have retired a lot earlier if she'd taken the <laughs> Cisco job. <laughs> That's, those are decisions you make. So decisions you right. move, so you're in Austin, and then you quit when you're living in Austin, or had you moved back to the Bay Area? We were in Austin, and um, at the time I decided to quit, it was late 1989. The 386 was in fab or close to going into fab, so I figured I'd done my work. There wasn't an interest to do a 46, so it was kind of like, well, you know. Right. I, what am I, uh, and waiting until the 386 came out and, you know, trying again to do the 486 just seemed like mm -hmm. too far away, too right. long. And, right. and AMD had been a good company, and I enjoyed working there, but it was time to do something different if I was ever going to do it. I figured mm -hmm. that was the time. And I didn't want to, I was a corporate officer at that point, so, you know, I had some fiduciary duties to a company, right. and I took those seriously, so I wasn't off interviewing at other companies. I just said, I'm going to quit. Uh, we picked a date, it was in January, so they could get somebody else in and have an orderly transition. I remember walking out the door middle of January, and is like, okay, now what am I going to do? And Colleen... So this was January I, 1990? 1990. Okay. And I told Colleen, uh, well, we have some and savings. sorry, and you had moved back to the Bay Area by now? Nope. Or you was, we were you in still Austin. in Austin. We're okay, in Austin. so you quit, and now you've got to... We quit, we're in Austin, and we, we thought we'd stay in Austin. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you know, I want to do a startup, so give me six months, we've got some savings, uh, we can get by on savings for six months. If at the end of six months, uh, I can't figure out what to do, then I'll get a real job, I'll crawl back to AMD, or I'll get a job at TI or Motorola or something like that. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm, you know, six months, give me six months. And I had some ideas. My main idea was a Windows graphics accelerator. I remember talking to Michael Dell about it and so forth. Um, but there was just no venture capital in Texas. Uh, there was one company up in Dallas and I drove up and talked with them a bunch of times, but you could tell they had a waiting room full of people. Yeah. <laughs> this was a monopoly. So getting money out of them and, and sitting so in the waiting the room, I talked to them. Guys out of Tech? Hmm? Was it, were these the guys out of Moss Tech? Yeah. What was the name? Seven Rosen. Seven Rosen. Yeah, yeah. they're very successful. So I, I can't remember who I talked to, but it was pretty clear just talking to people in the waiting room that they'd been there multiple times and that, you know, this process was not tilted in the favor of the startup right. person. And I, I, I had six months. <laughs> you know, that was my, my time limit. So I told Colleen, hmm, you know, I, I'm going to have to talk to people in Silicon Valley. Uh, maybe they'll fund us in Texas. Well, of course, nobody in Silicon Valley back then wanted to ever get on an airplane to go anywhere. Okay. Although that trend had just started. Uh, there was one or two exceptions. Um, but there was a lot of interest in my background, having run all these business units and you know, being processors. So I ended up talking to oh, the processor company in Plano. There are a lot of these VCs wanted me to run existing companies. Mm -hmm. So I went and talked to a bunch of them in the Bay Area and in uh, Silicon Valley and in uh, Texas, just to sort of see what they're like and why did you put money in this company and why are you excited about this company and to get an idea of what made a good startup from the point of view of venture capitalists. What, what does a venture capitalist want to see? Because I never dealt with these venture capitalists. 
So that was very enlightening. Uh, what I found was almost all the companies were me too's. You know, right. we're going to do processors because there's a lot of money in the processor business. We're going to do this because a lot of other people are doing that. And I never liked the me too thing. You know, I, I was more interested in developing new stuff for new markets. Um, although it could be harder if it worked, it could be much more rewarding in a lot of dimensions, including monetarily. So after a few months of talking to VCs, I ended up running into the guys at uh, Rambus, uh, mm -hmm. Farmold and Horowitz. And um, of all the people I talked with, they, they had the wildest idea technically, but it was like, well, if they can make it work, this could be really good. I'd done enough work with processors to realize that there was going to be a continual rapid improvement in processor performance and in graphics performance and that these things needed memory and that memory was not on the same pr trajectory in terms of performance improvement rate. So processors are going up like that and memory speeds are going like that. Processors are no good without memory. So at some point there is going to be a big problem, a memory bottleneck. And uh, Mike and Mark had an idea for a 500 megahertz memory interface, which was to put in perspective, around 20 times faster than existing memories at the time. And okay. the VCs would always talk about, you need 10x, you need to be right. 10x better. So this was like 20x better. And uh, it required doing stuff that was past my technical abilities. But one thing I'd learned was to ask a lot of questions. I'd managed a lot of people being successful in sort of getting a sense of which engineers can do stuff and which can't. <laughs> And, and you're really making bets on people right. in any business. So although I couldn't do it myself, I was pretty good at asking a lot of questions. People like Tony Holbrook, especially, you know, or Phil Downing before him, you know, sort of showed me how to ask lots of questions. <laughs> drill, <laughs> drill down, see if, right. drill down, I think Tony was the guy who made the analogy, you know, you drill down, you know, you, if, if every time you drill down, you find that there's substance. You know, the answer to the question right and intelligently, you don't have to drill a lot of times. Right. But if you drill and you just find a whole lot of funny answers, you know, it probably means that, you know, there's, there's nothing anywhere. Okay. It's like exploring for oil. So, um, so, so what I found with Mike and Mark is they really seemed to know what they were talking about. They really seemed to have a, they, they clearly had a strong experience in doing architectures. Uh, Mark had done the MIPSEX program at Stanford. Mike had worked on uh, MIPS processors uh, at uh, a previous startup. And uh, Horowitz really understood the, the physics required to do very high speed signaling. The predecessors are really CERTES and the phase lock loops and stuff that would be required. Mm -hmm. So um, I came back telling Colleen, you know, wow, I found this company is, is only like. How, how did you meet them? Was it through a oh, VC? Yeah, I, I was talking to a bunch of VCs, and the VCs would always listen to my proposals and say very politely, well, you know, maybe you should consider this, maybe you should get consider that. And when I talked to Mike and Mark, uh, uh, and, and I've been introduced to, uh, I actually talked to two different groups, Bill Davidow yeah. at uh, Moore Davidow, and Bruce Dunleavy, who at the time was Merrill Pickard, but later Benchmark uh, Capital, which is still in existence. And those two had already invested in these guys. Okay. Because these guys had this idea but more importantly, Intel had verbally agreed to use the technology in a 486 processor okay. uh, and do put a Rambus memory interface on a 486 processor. So interestingly, a whole bunch of threads came together. Yep. Intel was doing this because they were concerned about the performance threat of risk architectures. So if risk architectures presented a performance threat and Intel couldn't shift from x86 because of all the code base. Why give up the code base advantage? But to stay ahead in performance, they were thinking, okay, well, if we break the memory bottleneck, maybe they can keep us ahead in performance compared to these risk guys. So I think that was their So that their was an incredible thinking. coup to get Intel to buy into that. Well, it was a handshake at that point in time. And, yeah, well. and it wasn't necessarily committed product yeah. and it ended up falling apart. <laughs> but it gave you some confidence perhaps. In and that. it fell apart because uh, my old group got the 386 working <laughs> and when the 386 was working and people saw there was a second source of the 386, the interest in x86 uh, risk 
evaporated. Right. And Intel called us one day, and we ended up signing a contract with Intel. So my first six months, we signed a contract. By the time we signed the contract, it was probably around when the 386 started, what came out of fab and was working, and then later on in 1990, AMD was marketing it. And all the PC guys were going, great, now there's a second source, so we can can all of these the risk, right. risk architectures we're working on. So I think what I had done before <laughs> was to put the kibosh on what we were doing with Intel. Whether, if the 386 had never come out, who knows what would have happened right. with Intel. So the whole premise with Rambus was we could make this high-speed memory interface work and that Intel would quickly use it. Well, we ended up making it work, although it took more people and more time, more money than... Now you went in as CEO? I went as CEO. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And this was in 1990? 1990. 1990. Six months after the January when you quit, basically, probably. Uh, yeah, I think it was May of 1990. Okay, all right. That, that I ended five up joining. Months. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's about five months. So again, close to my end of my window. Right. <laughs> with Colleen. And, and it was like four, it was like a month before that I, you know, I decided emotionally I want to join. It was a matter of figuring out, uh, you know, how we could afford to live in the Bay Area. Yes. Yeah, so I just said, well, I, I can't afford to live in the Bay Area on that. On that. So right. I said, I guess I'll have to forget this and go back to Texas and work on something there. And they, they came running back and saying, well, no, no, we, we can work something out. Okay, so, good. So eventually we got to a salary where I could, could figure out we could afford to rent something and then potentially buy something that was nowhere near like the house we owned in Austin, but mm -hmm. that was be acceptable. Yep. Um, so yeah, I started directly as CEO. The co-founders had no interest in being uh, even managing people, much less being CEO. So there's no, none of this, some people become CEO and the co-founders wanted to be CEO and they have other own, own set of issues. I didn't have any of yep. those kind of issues, mm -hmm. fortunately. Um, so, uh, and I was CEO because the venture capitalists wanted somebody who had proven management experience and had run much larger teams. So when I left AMD, I think I had f over 500 people reporting to me. Okay. Now, now I had three. <laughs> uh, so there's a belief that I can scale up for quite a while with this organization. And where was, <coughs> where we located, where was the office? In uh, the office when I joined was, uh, there wasn't an office. Okay. What, what we had was, uh, we were using one of the conference rooms at Moore Davidow. Okay. There's just three of them, mm -hmm. and now I was fourth. And we hired another person, fifth, before we ended up getting some space. And Farmall, Farmall, not Farmall, Horowitz was a Stanford professor. And although he was taking a leave of absence, he wanted to stay, the, his, his agreement with the VCs that the office would be within five miles of Stanford at all times. So uh, the cost of real estate goes down linearly from Stanford. Mm -hmm. uh, and going north didn't make sense because there's no engineers to the north. Right. Going south was where you'd wanted to go f to attract engineers. So uh, El Camino and San Antonio Road was five yeah. miles. So we looked around there and we found something, um, a very modest small office with room for maybe 15, 20 people at most. And uh, we rented that and moved into it with a short term lease. Okay. It was behind, behind a, a pub, uh, <laughs> behind a pub, uh, it's Just still there, the Camino. office. Right. Yeah, it, it, the office building's still there. So um, it looks the same. It doesn't look <laughs> like anything's changed. So we were there for about a year. And the whole time I was at Rambus, we were within a block, two blocks of El Camino in San Antonio. So what was your first thing you had to do when you walked into Rambus? You're, there's this bright idea, there's three people, um, you're a new CEO. Um, well, they needed a plan. Okay. Uh, and, and they needed a contract signed with Intel. Um, but m more to the point, they needed a plan. So, so the, the, plan, the plan was, hmm, we'll do a high-speed memory interface. Somehow we'll get a bunch of DRAM companies to use it, and Intel will, will put it on their chip. And then somehow we'll make some money. But nobody had ever done a semiconductor IP business model before. Right. That's a totally new area. Was well, was uh, 
the Ar wrist arm arm was around arm arm i'm sure was around but they weren't on our radar yeah you know yeah. arm like rambus took years to yep percolate along mm -hmm. and you know rambus later when we went public most people assume that you know we just started like in 95 went public in 97. Right. <laughs> uh, so the, it takes a lot of a lot of time so sure. arm was out there bubbling away in cambridge somewhere but we weren't aware of them so they were doing a similar thing. Uh, they originally started building chips or computers, and because that failed, they sort of were forced yeah, to try something to IP. Really in, in our case, it wasn't, the company didn't really have a clear plan when I came on board. So I remember drafting up a straw man plan mm -hmm. as part of the whole interview process, partly to help me think things through and partly to get on the same wavelength as the rest of the team. And the big question was, would we do our own chips? or or what um, so the presumption had been that we would do our own chips mm -hmm. uh, and that's how we would make money but uh, the presumption f failed in several dimensions uh, well first off the the deal with Intel fell through and Intel didn't want to pay us any money <laughs> being Intel <laughs> right. so Intel's thing was okay well we'll create a market but we're not gonna pay anything we're going to pay a nickel, um, but we'll have the rights to use your IP oh. on processors. <laughs> I see. And you can make money from the DRAM guys. How did they get the rights if they weren't giving you any money? Uh, that, was, that had been the handshake deal before, before my time. I see. You know, the venture capitalists had negotiated with people at Intel. Bill David, I would come from Intel. And the basic elements of the idea was uh, you guys make money some other way, and because Intel's premise was we, we never pay royalties to anybody. That seemed, that was a non-negotiable point in all of our dealings with Intel. Uh, Intel's view was just that, you know. And they were big, and they were the gorilla. So if you wanted to work with them, you had to do things. You could do it their way, or right. you could not work with them. <coughs> and at that point in time, if you were gonna do a high-speed memory interface, it, 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 was, it was very clear is like, okay, where do memories, and these were DRAM memories, where do DRAM memories go? It was something like 90% went into PCs. Mm -hmm. What percent market share does Intel have of PCs? 95%. Percent. Right. <laughs> so it's like, okay, if Intel, if you're not gonna work with Intel, yeah. somehow you have to build a high-speed memory interface with the other 15% of the market. Mm -hmm. Good luck, you know. Now, now maybe you're focused on graphics chips or something. Now it's a way nichier play. Mm -hmm. way easier if you can get Intel on board. Got it. Because of that dynamics, it sort of forced you to do a deal with Intel and it forced you to do whatever deal you could get by with. And as a startup, you don't have any leverage and Intel had gigantic leverage and strong positions and thinking about things. So, but, but even then, there hadn't really been a clear plan put together about how this company would make money. The, the sort of hope had been, I think, that we'd we'd write up a bunch of slides, we'd file a bunch of patents, and then we'd just license them on the patents, and they could figure out how to make the rest of it work. Okay. Well, it was pretty clear that that wasn't gonna work. That even, that, that to convince people to use our technology, we had to design and build stuff and make it work and prove it out. Uh, the, the working assumption was that people would see that this was such a good idea that they'd go off and invest all the effort to make it work themselves. Let me understand something here. So if it was, this interface was put onto the memory chip, mm -hmm. it didn't matter whether that same interface existed on the microprocessor? You could still get the benefit of much higher performance memory? You said Intel didn't go ahead with. Right, right, right. So Intel ultimately didn't go ahead. And the whole Intel thing confuses the sort of telling of the story, but it's it's an inconvenient fact. No, it's an important <laughs> starting seed. And, and, and because we have the handshake with Intel, and because Intel was willing to tell that to memory guys, that got us deals with the memory guys. Got it. Okay. Um, and what became apparent was that we were going to have to show the memory guys exactly how to implement our technology. Okay. And we weren't going to get away with just, here's a license to our patents, <laughs> right. here's a copy of our slides, you can figure it out. Um, Intel wanted every memory to be completely interchangeable with every other memory. And the devices that were coming out in the memory business at that point f using JEDEC standards uh, were not compatible with each other. Hmm. It, 
it's, it's hard to write a document and think of everything that has to be compatible. Um, to ensure compatibility, you, you, you have to do, you, you have to have test suites, you have to have net lists, you have to have a whole bunch more than just a written document. So um, in, Intel was insistent that we implement the memory interface for the memory guys uh, and, and work with them to implement it and teach, teach Intel how to do it as well. So before the deal fell apart, which was about a year into my time there, um, we were able to sign deals with two memory guys, Toshiba and Fujitsu. Uh, and good thing too, because otherwise we would have had a real hard time surviving once Intel dropped off. Because of Intel's involvement, they were excited to work and they assigned some of their better people. And uh, their people were very interested in this high-speed memory interface technology and together, working together, we were able to eventually build DRAMs that implemented this high-speed 500 megahertz technology working pretty much exactly as originally planned. It took And you did way not longer need and more that engineers. interface on the microprocessor. As well, you did. It? You did. Oh, and okay. and that's, that's what made our business model so difficult compared to ARM. In the case of ARM, uh, ARM just has to convince their one customer and ARM's processor is inside that chip. Right. And any chip that it touches doesn't need to know that there's an ARM processor inside. What we needed to do was to do all the technology work, but also we had to convince DRAM companies and companies the DRAMs hooked up to, right. processors or graphics chips or other devices, to simultaneously adopt a new memory interface, which was useless for connecting to any other kind of memory. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we had to get all these companies to jump at the same time, and the whole dynamics of pricing in the DRAM business worked against this because uh, in the DRAM business back at that point in time, there was 20 suppliers, and the reason prices were were it, the reason you got commodity prices is because if you didn't like the price from one supplier, there was yep. 19 others to go to. As soon as you're talking about two suppliers of DRAMs, well, the the dynamics are different. You know, they're not. You know, they know that customer wants two suppliers so you're going to get at least a third of the business so you don't have to be as aggressive mm -hmm. and you know they would always blame it on our royalties they said well our prices are high because of those royalties we've got to pay Rambus <laughs> but that was baloney it was it was because they had the leverage to get a better price what sort of royalty would they pay uh, the, the DRM guys paid basically one percent royalty okay uh, there was variations on the theme, and some of them started a little higher, especially the later guys, but basically it was 1%. 1% mm -hmm. royalties, which for the value we were delivering, 20 times higher performance, yes. seemed like a good deal, but the DRM guys were used to paying 0% royalties, so right. they never quite saw it the same way. And uh, there was a, a lot of... Today, semiconductor IP licensing is kind of a given. People are used to building chips out of blocks, and and having to license IP, sometimes for a license fee, sometimes including a royalty, like ARM still gets royalties. Mm -hmm. But back in 1990, <coughs> there was huge emotional resistance to paying any royalties. Because at that point in time, um, people were used to doing everything themselves. There was a lot of NIH. And when they paid royalties, it was because some big guy like TI had a big war chest of patents. Yes. And they, you know, came along and said, you know, you're infringing our stuff. We invented all this DRAM stuff. You, you, now you owe us money. So emotionally, they put us in that bucket as opposed to in a bucket of, hey, we're showing you how to do something that makes your chip run 20 times faster that gives you a more valuable product that gives you some pricing leverage. Of course, Intel didn't really want to pay more for it either, so that worked <laughs> against this. <laughs> Intel was like, we don't want to pay any price premium, even if it does run 20 times faster. That was, that was a bit of a challenge. So we had a lot of challenges in getting this off the ground because we had to make it all work technically, then we had to convince enough DRAM people and at least one big logic company to all jump at the same time and hope everything worked, technically and pricing and all that kind of stuff. So it was very incredible challenging. sales job, Jed. How did you right. pull this off? <laughs> <laughs> uh, persistence and the memory bottleneck. Right. Uh, the what, what was clear to everybody, including Intel, was that at some point they'd need to use something like what Rambus was doing. 
that um, we we talked to Intel. We talked to Intel every year after they broke off talks with us, um, and they'd say, "Hey, well, you know, it's clear we're going to have to do something because the trajectory was the same thing every year. The trajectory of what the DRAM guys are doing on their own is not going to keep up with our trajectory. And if and, and you can make you can get higher bandwidth by going to wider buses, but wider buses meant buying more memory." And more memory meant more expensive PC, and there was a, a limit to how wide a bus could be within the economics of the PC business. Uh, mini computers, super supercomputers, yeah, not supercomputers, uh, workstations. That, that's different. Workstations they could afford to have much more memory because they were doing bigger tasks. But PCs were most DRAMs were going, and especially with laptops, there's also a, a, a size and weight constraint. It was only such, you know, 64 bits wide was about as wide as they would go. Yeah. And you could put more pins on the DRAM package, but there was an economic limit to that before they started to become expensive and the package became more expensive than the die. So eight bits wide, 64 bit buses, eight DRAMs, that was kind of the upper limit. And if you couldn't get the bandwidth out of the eight DRAMs um, that you wanted, then you needed to go to higher speed signaling to break the bottleneck. That was pretty clear for the mainstream PC. And it was just a matter of time before we'd get there. So we eventually got there, but fortunately for us, other applications got there first. Um, once we got everything working, and the Japanese company stuck with us, and their ASIC groups developed an ASIC capability to, to put us on the device. We had a few low volume design wins with people like Silicon Graphics that had a need, but mm -hmm. very low volume. Uh, but at least it was something. It gave us some credibility and gave the Japanese companies we were dealing with more confidence in our technology. So, so when did you start to get these first real design? Uh, I think it was like 84, 83 time frame. So three or four years after you started. Yeah. Yeah, Silicon Graphics, Brocade. Um, no, no, 93, 94. Sorry, yeah, yeah. See, I right. told you I wasn't good at dates. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, 93, 94, that kind of time frame. So the big opportunity for us that turned us around was Nintendo. Mm -hmm. So we, we had focused originally on, okay, there's PCs and then there's graphics chips. And we were never very successful with graphics chips. We got Cirrus to use us, but the rest of their chip wasn't very competitive with what somebody like NVIDIA was doing at the time. The NVIDIAs were using more specialized memories. For various reasons, we didn't get traction. But a, 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 a chip that combined graphics and processing was a, a game chip. So the video games were taken off in performance, needed aggressive price points. And Nintendo wanted to do a 3D game. Uh, up until that point, all the games were like this 2D stuff, uh, right. Pac-Man and Pong and, and so forth. Um, they were better and better 2D, 2D games, but Nintendo wanted more lifelike 3D uh, rendering and images, and they worked with Silicon Graphics. Silicon Gra Graphics showed them the software and the hardware engines required to get the kind of uh, uh, images that they wanted, but now they couldn't afford a $20,000 Silicon Graphics workstation, they needed to build a game for a few hundred bucks, which meant the semiconductors needed to cost dozens of dollars. And their main partner and supplier was NEC. And NEC was the company that had licensed us a little while later uh, and done ASICs for, I think, Silicon Graphics. So there was a relationship, NEC with Silicon Graphics, NEC with Nintendo, NEC was, saw that Silicon Graphics could build successfully a chip. So NEC uh, basically said, hey, well, if, if you can use RAM bus technology, we're willing to do the chips for you, and we can supply the DRAMs. And in Japan, multi-sourcing is less of a concern. You, you do things based on relationships, and they believe that NEC would take care of them and give them competitive pricing. Uh, it's a very different dynamic over there, fortunately for us, because without that, it might not have worked. And I remember being in the, uh, the meeting with the Nintendo big boss. He's a smart guy, but not a technical guy. He's more a business guy. And we were there with the engineering VP for Nintendo and, and a couple of my key technical people. And the, the big Nintendo boss kept going, do I have to use this, this RAM bus memory? Why can't I just use standard memory? And the VP of engineering said, well, you want 3D graphics performance, so you need this kind of bandwidth. You want 
$300 price point, so we need this kind of cost. I can either meet your cost budget with standard memories, but we'll have low bandwidth, or I can meet your performance target, but we'll have a wide bus and we can't meet the cost target. So the only way to do both is to have a memory where we can get 500 megabytes per second out of a single DRAM. Because their minimum configuration would have one DRAM in, okay. in our thing. And they, had, they wanted to have an option to ins install a second DRAM for an expansion module, which was technically challenging. And so at that meeting, you know, we went around for an hour and you know, <laughs> we're sitting there listening to these guys basically debate, you know, why, do, why should I use this stuff from this little risky company? Right. And NEC was there as well and was saying, hey, you know, technically we'll vouch for it. You know, we've done enough work with these guys, we can make it work. So the big boss said, well, NEC tells me your royalties are too high, so you have to cut your royalties. <laughs> we were getting like 1% royalties. So right. he said, okay, well, we'll cut them in half. Uh, and in return, we, I said, well, you have to give us a free game for every employee. <laughs> so, so we did get a free game. So okay. we were the first on our blocks to get uh, the games. They were with all, this only software was in Japanese when it first <laughs> came out. But my, my son figured out how to make it work anyways, sure. and the other kids. And then uh, uh, the other issue is they said, okay, uh, we, we were doing all this 500 megahertz on a four-layer printed circuit board, which at the time was considered pretty good. So Nintendo's big boss said, well, I want to build it in China to keep costs under control, so you need to make it work on a two-layer printed circuit board, <laughs> 500 megahertz. <laughs> Worst case, signaling. So my, and we had a connector, remember, with an expansion. So this was not trivial. So. My guys, when I got back to the office, said, oh, no way, we can never make it work on two layers. So I said, okay, well, we had to exchange some emails. The guy said, okay, well, then we won't, we won't use you. <laughs> I don't know what else they would have done. So I said, they won't use us. So, so we've lost them. And so they said, well, give us the weekend, you know. So they went away and they dummied up something. And we went back a week later to Japan and showed a two-layer printed circuit board running at 500 megahertz. Much to everybody's surprise. And about when was this, Jeff? Oh, this is like 84, 84. 85. Okay. Sorry, 94, 94 95. 95. <laughs> Time frame. And meanwhile, how were the VCs watching what was going on? Were they concerned? How much money was in the company by then? Oh, uh, I remember Bill Davidow saying at some point later, you know, if I'd known what would have happened with Intel, I never would have invested in this company. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it was too much of a science experiment for their liking. Um, yep. And, you know, we struggled to keep things going. So we were able to do more rounds. You know, we had up rounds, but we'd started with quite a low valuation. The company yeah. was only valued at $4 million when we got started. Right. Uh, that was an A round. You know, these days, that wouldn't even be a seed round. Right. Um, and we only raised like a million bucks. Fortunately, I was able to negotiate big licensing dollars from the memory guys. So, okay. so Toshiba and Fujitsu, the first two guys, they paid us $5 million each. Mm. And I remember the Fujitsu guys came over and negotiated with us. They had, they had more lawyers than we had engineers at the time. In fact, they were looking around going, where is everybody? <laughs> <laughs> Why are we paying you all this money? <laughs> Who are the, where's all your engineers? You know? So, uh, and we were able to continue to get that kind of uh, those license fees from the DRAM guys, and there was 20 DRAM guys. So even though we didn't have an Intel, you right. know, there was enough potential. So the company was really we funded by the licensing fees then, rather than by the for the most capitals. part. Yeah. I, th I think by the time we went public, we'd raised three quarters of our capital consumed from licensing fees. And because mm -hmm. of the licensing fees, we were able to do continuing rounds with the VCs as right. well. Right, so you weren't heavily diluted then. Right, right. right. So it was a bit of smoke and mirrors to make that work. <laughs> I, I don't mean, I wasn't misleading anyone, but we were having to sell these guys that there will be a market. We didn't have an Intel anymore, <laughs> like the first couple of guys. But it was a competitive space and there's 20 DRAM companies. Fortunately for us, there was 20 DRAM companies. So we were able to find a third and a fourth and a fifth who figured, hey, there's enough, you know, for them, five million bucks wasn't that big a deal. They were used to building billion dollar fabs. And having a value added memory sounded like something of potential interest, even though there was no s sockets yet that existed for that. But we were able to convince them that there will be a market 
and it takes time to develop these things. So slowly but surely, we got things that slowly build momentum and go forward. Mm -hmm. But it was tough, and there was times where it wasn't obvious it was going to all hold together. I can imagine. And the VCs were supportive. You know, they sunk money in. <laughs> yeah, like like Bill said, they wouldn't have done it if they'd known. But of course. I should have told Bill, well, I wouldn't have, wouldn't have joined, I would take the job if you told <laughs> right. me that Intel was going to fall apart either. Right. <laughs> Two-way street here, but it ended up working out. So when did you start generating revenue? Oh, we, well, we had revenue in the form of licensing fees from the start. The first deal yeah, I with... I guess you consider the that The first revenue. deal with yeah. the... Yes, that was revenue. Yeah. The according to the accountants. Yep. Uh, the first deal we signed, uh, we got the first check right around Christmas, mm -hmm. the first year that I joined. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so we, we had revenue all along, but we weren't profitable. We became profitable or cash flow positive uh, shortly after Nintendo. About 85. So. Yeah, I, well, it was more 95, like 86, 95. It was more like 96, I think, yeah. because... With Nintendo, you know, we, we, it was a lot of work to convince them. Once we convinced them, the actual engineering to, to get their ASIC device working went pretty smooth, and our part of it was pretty straightforward. We'd, we'd already implemented other ASICs and so forth, so mm -hmm. it was more mechanical at that point. We'd done it before multiple times, uh, so we weren't in the critical path. In fact, when all the hardware, all the chips were working, and they built up a board, uh, we figured, okay, well, production will start soon. And we had another meeting with them, and they said, well, the software guys say they need another year to, to get the software where they want it to be. So we were sitting there for a year. Mm -hmm. But when it came out, the Nintendo 64 was a huge hit. Yep. It was it a was. huge hit. Yep. And yep. Our, customers, our customers had wondered if we could ever get a 500 megahertz memory interface to work and figured it was only for supercomputers. So when the first really big hit was a game, a kid's game that sold it, you know, for a few hundred bucks, mm -hmm. whatever the exact price was, I don't remember, uh, is like, wow, you know, and it's two layer printed circuit board. So, <laughs> so that gave us instant credibility. Yep, All of the rest of our customers, you know, at least had four layer printed circuit boards. So if we can make it work there, we can make it work anywhere. So now all the people who had shown interest but wanted to avoid risk started piling in, including Intel. Did you have a standard design that each of the DRAM companies could use, or did you have to create something different for their process technologies? You know, there was no real foundries back, right. back in the day. Um, so there was no concept of a standard design. Okay. Um, we, we had a standard. There was a Rambus memory interface standard. Right. So to be compatible, you you had to be comp you had to meet all of these electrical specifications at the interface, and then we implemented. Th they gave us their their process design Designs. rules, mm -hmm. and we implemented the interface for them. Okay. For the first do the actual five lay years the layout for the first five years, we did everything. Wow. Uh, and then we would work with them on the core because the interface went from, you know, the, they, were, they were used to delivering data at, say, a 30 megahertz data rate over 8 bits. Now we had a 500 megahertz interface over 8 bits. So the interface had to change, and we basically designed the interface for them. At the pins, it's running 500 megahertz, but it would fan out internally into, like, a 64-bit wide bus running at whatever it was, 62 megahertz, some lower data rate where things became more digital. Mm -hmm. And that's where our customers would hook up. But then we had to work with them on a lot of stuff about the DRAM core. So we ended up learning all sorts of stuff about how DRAMs worked internally, and different customers would implement stuff differently. But we had to make it all look like one, D, one DRAM. So there was an issue about how to pipeline things to get high performance but keep the the die area low and so forth and so on. So we were like, you know, learning and consulting at the same time. With the first couple of guys, we were more learning, and then later we were more consulting mm -hmm. um, and showing people, okay, we'll do the interface, we'll bring in a bus that's X wide, and then here's the core changes you need to make in order to 
keep your die size low, but be able to deliver 10 times the bandwidth. And there's a lot of analog design here, essentially, right? The oh yeah, tons of analog stuff. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, everything was handcrafted, hand custom. There's no standard cell libraries, yep. any of that kind of stuff. These are full custom chips. Well, what and kind of design tools were you using? Oh, um, there was, there was, back in those days, you, you got tools from the daisies or the mentors. There were mm -hmm. like workstations right. that were proprietary. O over in time, things became more based on servers and the graphics interface became more standardized, less, less company specific. But remember, I didn't do any, any of the real design. <laughs> right. So I would see what the people were working on when right. I come by their layout stations and so forth. And I remember writing checks for you know, CAD tools and CAD equipment was a big part of our outlay yep. besides salary. It was salary and stuff to CAD people uh, and, and stuff to server people. That was the three big bucks that we had to spend And about on. how many employees did you have by this 95, 96 time frame? Oh, let's see. Uh, I, think, I think at the time that we... At the time that we signed the first agreements, we had like 10 people. Okay. Um, at the time we were convincing Nintendo to work with us, and to do that we had gotten some customers in the low volume production and got ASICs working, and we built reference designs and reference systems. We were in the 30 people range. Okay. And by the time we went public, we were in the 100 person range. And what year was that? We went public in 97. 97. And the, the shift that happened was um, we were doing all of the designs for the DRAM companies. Uh, when we shook hands with Intel in 96, Intel wanted not what we developed, but a much faster version of what we developed. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had to do a second version pushing performance even more, and Intel wanted us to license every DRAM company even though the DRAM companies didn't really want to <laughs> license us in many cases. Business-wise, business uh, you know, I tried to get Intel to take an approach of, well, let's license half of the DRAM companies, and that'll give you 10 suppliers. You know, with 10 suppliers, you're getting towards commodity pricing. You know? right. But Intel would be like, well, no, no, we, we're so big, and we're going to use so much RAM bus DRAM, we have to have everybody. The reality was that eventually they had to have everybody. And my, my pitch to them was, look, there's a certain set of people who are willing participants, and there's a certain set of people who are unwilling participants. It's a lot easier to work with willing participants. Plus, we're a small company. Getting 20 DRAM companies launched on a new memory technology simultaneously is a huge engineering effort. So as usual, I lost <laughs> the debate with Intel. <laughs> I lost every debate with Intel. <laughs> Intel is a good company, um, but as somebody would say, they don't dance well with others. They're used to doing things their way. Yeah. And it's pretty hard to move them off their thinking. And you know, they've been successful, so that's, that's fine. So they insisted, no, we have to get everybody going. So, so that forced us to hire a lot of people. It, we had to do a lot of work to develop this new memory technology, but we also had to have a number of people to support 20 DRAM companies which forced us to have to teach the DRAM companies how our interface worked. We couldn't possibly design 20 different total custom right. memory interfaces in parallel and then do it again every year and a half as you move to higher density memories. Um, that wasn't a feasible approach. So it forced us to teach the DRAM guys, which was unfortunate because that's when they started to really learn how our technology worked and light bulbs started to come on and then they started using our ideas in some of their other memory technologies. Mm. For so which you could not get the license. Hmm? And you could not get a license fee in those other applications. Oh, uh, yeah, there was, there was, um, when we started the company, there was page mode DRAMs and by the time we were in production with Nintendo. <coughs> Things had moved to uh, what was the what was the next step? But then there was synchronous DRAM, which was kind of playing off of one of the ideas of a Rambus DRAM to to clock the DRAM rather than have everything everything be asynchronous. 
but his performance was way below RAM plus DRAM. And then there was okay. double data rate synchronous DRAM, yeah, yeah. which was when things were starting to become potentially competitive. Also, although what they were able to do was still way below what we were able to do. It, was, it took them years and years to catch up. But they caught up by using more and more of our technology, which they figured out because we were forced to teach them how our stuff worked. Um, phase lock loops in a DRAM was not something any of these guys were comfortable <laughs> with or used to, and they couldn't see any reason why they needed to use it. And I remember being in a meeting with Samsung where, where we were teaching them how it worked and why you needed it, and you, you could see the light bulbs going on. It was like all of a sudden, ah, well that's why you use it, that's how you do it, you know. And because of our requirement to teach them, it laid the groundwork for labor, later problems where they took our ideas and stuck them in other memory devices. Yeah. The, the philosophy at all these memory companies was, you know, patents are for the lawyers to worry about. Our job is to build what we need to build to keep the factories full. And uh, because of the concerns about paying us royalties, there continued to be work on other kinds of memory devices which didn't pay us royalties, but of course they used our inventions, so eventually right. they did pay us royalties, but not at the time. And the IPO in 97, again, this was a different kind of company you were trying to take public. Was there much of a challenge in selling the idea of a public company working on this kind of basis? Um, no, I don't recall there being a challenge. Uh, there was an issue of educating people. Right. Um, because before every chip company had built chips. Mm -hmm. So we were a semiconductor company, so it's like, well, what chips do you build? Right. <laughs> you know, but, you know, people had already gone through the fab versus fabless yes. evolution. Uh, okay. So some people started calling us a chipless chip company. Right. I never particularly used that term, but... Uh, just like a fabless company had to do everything that a fab company did, um, we had to do pretty much everything a chip producing company would have to do. Mm -hmm. We had testers, uh, we had product <coughs> engineers, but, but the, our relative focus was different. We didn't have to have hundreds of manufacturing people because we didn't have fabs and we didn't have to have, we just had to have enough to test engineering to show our customers here's how to do production test but we didn't have to do production tests on a regular basis. Right. So we had all the same elements of a chip company, but instead we would license critical portions And of you the didn't chip. need a big sales force out selling a proprietary design? We needed a sales force, but it wouldn't have been as nearly as big as if we were selling some sort of right. chip. Right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, it was a matter of sort of taking the fabless trend that already had worked and sort of using that as an analogy. Okay, mm -hmm. well chip companies used to do all this stuff and then you carve out the fab. So we're like a chip company, but now we, we, we carve out some other steps. But we're doing all the design work. So we're not a patent licensing company. Yes, we have patents which we license. Intel has patents too. Uh, but what we're doing is we're transferring design know-how. What we're, we're giving the customers is the ability to design the chips setting up standards, giving them the actual physical designs, or teaching them how to do the physical designs, and setting up an ecosystem in which they can build chips that are compatible and make money. So the patents are just one part of it. This isn't, here's our patents, you know, figure out what to do with it. This is a total solution. And what we showed them was, uh, and at that point there wasn't this concept, but you know, what ha happens today is when you build up a, a, a logic chip, you have blocks all around the chip you've licensed from different players. Some of the really big companies do all their own blocks, but f most chip companies get this block, you know, they get a DSP from Tensilica, they get a processor from ARM, they get SRAM memory, usually from the foundry, they get the I.O. pads from the foundry, they get standard cells to do their own random logic from the foundry. Uh, there's all these people who provide them the different blocks, and people were used to that. But we were the first provider of a block of IP, which was licensed. And we were making the argument that this would be a trend in the future, and sure enough, people like ARM and stuff mm -hmm. popped up. And now today, I, semiconductor IP, most companies couldn't ship chips if they couldn't get IP blocks from companies. Uh, so IP 
the analogy we used was that this is going to be like a PC board. And a PC board in the old days, there's all these chips. You buy them from different companies. You wire them together and make your PC board. That's how chips are going to be developed, and we're one of the first of these kinds of blocks. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were able to tell the story pretty clearly, uh, but more importantly, we had a huge success with Nintendo, and we signed a contract with Intel, and that was more convincing <laughs> to the, to the <laughs> customers. The Nintendo stuff had already made us profitable, and the, the Intel business had the prospect if they were to adopt this as fully as they said, and Intel was out there saying, hey, we're going to make everything ramp us over time, it'll okay. take five years. With that, in the projections for the company's profitability were huge. So it was an easy sell, okay. especially well, compared to all the selling I had to do the, <laughs> the previous seven years <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> in much more difficult circumstances. And what was your revenue when you went public? And I presume you were profitable. Yeah, um, you know, profits and cash flow are different things. And right. uh, so I always tend to think more about cash. Yep, but cash we is king. were profitable because you had to be, in the old days, you had to be profitable to go public. Mm -hmm. You had to have X number of quarters of profits with steady growth. And, the, and you had to convince the bankers that you were going to be able to keep it up for at least X more quarters or else they wouldn't touch you. Of course, yep. today companies go public a totally different set yep. of metrics. Sure. And, and back in the old days, it was this old-fashioned approach, so we, you had to be profitable in order to go public. And do you remember roughly what the revenue was at that time? I don't. Okay, no problem. I don't. So from 90s... It's, it's all in the public record. It was <laughs> right. tens of millions of dollars, yeah. Yeah. which okay. generally was considered too little, but we were more like a software company than a chip company, mm -hmm. so you didn't have the, the profitability of the business was more like a hundred million dollar chip company. Right. And this profitability in the end that people care about. Sure. So from 97 on, where did the company go? What did you do? Uh, from 97, for the next several years, we were consumed with making the Intel stuff work. Mm -hmm. um, when we went public, we had a handshake, well, not, we didn't have a handshake, we had an agreement with Intel. And we were working on developing the kind of memory technology that Intel wanted. It was much faster and it had the capability to have uh, big memory systems, whereas what we'd done with the 500 megahertz was really for small memory subsystems, smaller amounts of memory. But PCs had to have the ability to have at least 16 and preferably 32 DRAMs with a modular expansion capability. Mm -hmm. So their, their real preference would be You'd have one row of DRAMs, and you could add up to three more rows of DRAMs. So you could start with 25% capacity and go to 100% capacity in chunks of 25%. And when push comes to shove, uh, at a minimum, you needed to have the ability to populate half the memory and upgrade another half of the memory. And the more granularity you could give, the better. That upgradability was a big issue because uh, sockets introduce huge signal integrity challenges mm -hmm. and building memory system where everything is soldered down is way easier than building memory system where there's one socket much right. less three sockets so number of sockets was the biggest challenge and that was the technical issue that took us the longest to work out we had some packaging concepts early on which didn't pan out um, fortunately intel helped us out and showed us some ideas and maybe not so much ideas, but sort of coaxed us in a better direction, and we ended up going to something that looked more like a traditional memory memory module. Uh, and we were able to get that to work, but the, the whole socketing thing was still the biggest challenge that we faced the whole way through. And ultimately, we had one glitch with Intel at the end, and it had to do with some narrow aspect of the socketing where, I, I don't even remember right now, where there was a glitches and occasional occasional situations, and. Mm -hmm maximum memory memory configurations. <coughs> Anyways, we, we figured it out and solved it, but it came at an awkward and uncomfortable time, so it was a big deal. How was the company organized at, at this time? You had a VP of engineering and... Uh, the company was organized pretty much the same way as it had been for a while. I think we changed it later, but uh, Dave Mooring was my VP of sales, uh, Sabode Taprani was the VP of marketing, 
Alan Roberts, the VP of Engineering. Ed Larson was the HR director or VP. Mm -hmm. um, finance was uh, Gary Harmon mm -hmm. at that time. Uh, this is all when we went public. Right. Uh, oh, I'm probably forgetting other key names, uh, but that's been a while now since we <laughs> went public. Well, how long has it been? We went public well, in 97, so that's 2017, 20 years. so 20, yeah, 20 years, years. a long time. Some kind of celebration there, Jeff. long time. So we were functionally organized. At late, at later on, we, we organized more by divisions, um, and we made Dave uh, president of the company. Uh, Laura Stark and Kevin Donnelly got executive roles uh, later on. They'd been with the company when we went public as well, but they became VPs later. So we had a lot of smart people, a lot of good talent. Uh, we changed the details a lot, but basically it was functional for a long time. Then we went to business unit setup mm -hmm. for the rest of the time. Uh, it was the basic, the basic organizational direction. What was it like trying to hire people into a strange company like this? Um, Did it take a lot was, of convincing? Hiring before we went public was was always a lot of work. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I learned over the years not to convince people. <laughs> Instead, what I learned uh, and what I have done subsequently at other startups is, is li life is like a menu, you know. P people want to do certain things. People have certain personality types and there's certain objectives that they have. And what you really want to look to do is to find people who what they love to do is what you need to have done. Where they want to go in their career aligns with where the company needs to go to be successful. You're looking for people where there's goal congruence and alignment. If you're convincing them, that means you're trying to get them to do something other than what they really want to do. Right. And when people get out of bed in the morning and want to go to work, it's because they're having fun. They're doing something they like. The people they work with is a critical part of it, too. So I learned long ago um, through you know, through hiring some hiring mistakes, that uh, the best thing to do is find people where there's this gigantic goal congruence. And the right people are people where fairly quickly you go, wow, this person is really great and could really help us out. Uh, and that person is going, you know, I don't need to go talk to any more companies. This is, this is where I want to be. So you look for that resonance where it's just like, and, but you only find those people occasionally. So we would interview a lot of people. Mm -hmm. We'd interview a lot of people, and most people didn't want to go to a risky startup. Uh, going to startups was more popular back then, but you know people were looking for low-risk startups, and Perfect. there aren't many of those. A lot of people want to join startups and don't really know what startups are like, so they'd see, hey, long hours, risk, all those kind of things. And I would just be very open with them and say, here's the good stuff, here's the bad stuff. You know, you mm -hmm. got to like all of it because you're going to figure it out. After you join, you'll find it all out, so you may as well tell you now. And uh, what happened was we were able to hire the people we needed. Uh, and uh, our turnover was extremely low mm -hmm. because we only hired people where there was a huge goal congruence. And when we had a bump in the road, it didn't cause them all to want to quit because they were doing what they liked to do. And we built a team of people who really liked working together with each other. So that team stayed together with very low turnover for a very long time. Okay. You know, we would let people go if they, if they couldn't cut it for some reason, but we didn't even have to do that very often. Uh, so hiring the right people at the start was always, mm -hmm. always critical, you know. And I had the benefit of having run businesses for 10 years before doing Rambus. So, you know, most of this thinking had happened before. Sure. So hiring is a, is a huge thing, and you want it to be, you, you've, you've got to put a lot of effort into hiring to be successful. Were you having to give much stock away? Um, oh, you know, the VCs never want to give away stock, so. <laughs> but too much is sort of a relative thing, so I, I don't right. really know compared to other companies uh -huh. that we, how much we gave away. I suspect we gave away less than most companies. But on the other hand, we were more successful than most companies. So right. uh, all, all of the executives are, you know, n none of them have to work. Uh, most of them are retired. Uh, sure. 
lots of the engineers, same thing. So everybody did well. And uh, if they didn't own a nice house, they, now they own a nice house. And sure. So I think it was a good, good, good risk reward for everyone. Didn't you get into some kind of issue with stock pricing at some one point? Oh yeah, yeah. You know, like a lot of companies did. Uh, Anything you want to tell us about that? Or oh, it's well documented. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I think uh, at Harvard Business School they didn't teach us about stock option pricing. <laughs> So there was, there was a transition where I think accounting rules, Gary Harmon always would complain that accounting rules used to be based on good judgment and then it became based on strict adherence to slavishly following a bunch of extremely complex rules. Mm -hmm. And the option pricing has to be done in very precise ways and I think we got caught up in that transition. Yeah. I always followed the advice from my experts. Right. And as far as I knew, what we were doing was what we were supposed to be doing. Sure. And I have this feeling that we were doing what our experts told us to do, but when, you know, everybody runs for cover when, uh, when these <laughs> issues occur and everybody lawyers up and right. there was years of litigation, a lot of money and time effort spent. Uh, in the end, you know, we, we weren't gaming any systems. We were doing what thought we thought was fair and reasonable yep. and logical and I think was the right thing for the shareholders. It was all about retaining people and doing the right things <laughs> to retain people and stuff. Right. There were some companies that may have been gaming systems. There were slush funds. Uh, I read about some companies that did very different stuff. We didn't do any of those things. That's a trying time for you when you're uh, focusing yeah. on that rather than running the business. Oh, the option pricing occurred after. Ah, okay. I was uh, no longer running the business. Uh -huh. I was chairman of the company. Got it. Uh, which also meant the company wasn't as very invested in me perhaps didn't see the need to protect and circle me like some other CEOs who mm -hmm. were involved in stock option pricing, their companies handled very differently. Uh, but uh, I wasn't running the company at the time. The, the option pricing issues that came up had occurred while I was running the company. Right. And it was, and, but it all occurred, oh, you know, after we went public. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yep. So, so you left Rambus in 2005? Uh, I, I, well, I have a hard time getting my dates right, like yeah. I said earlier, but I think I was CEO until 2005, right. and okay. I think I f left Rambus as, as ah. a board member in 2006, oh. if I Got remember it. right, okay. as part of the whole option pricing thing. Yeah. It came up, it was becoming a big mess, so we agreed that I just get off the board, and, mm -hmm. and emotionally I was disconnecting from the company anyways I for imagine. various reasons. Right. You know, or the new CEO and I, you know, weren't on the same wavelength. <laughs> he, he was happier not to have me on the board, I'm sure. <laughs> mm, you know, that's probably true of most CEOs. Uh, yep. Don't really they want the prior CEO business. on they the don't. board. Yes. It's probably sure. unusual sure. that that, would go, that works out. So what did you do with yourself after you left? Um, after I left, I, um, I, I spent uh, a few years tied up in a lot of litigation. Wow. <laughs> Uh, it was the patent litigation as well. I had in my, I think I was called for depositions, uh, I've lost track, 30 times, 50 wow. times, maybe it was 50 days of depositions. Yeah. You, can, you can imagine this, but for 10 hours you know, <laughs> with stacks of documents right. with lawyers. And uh, so I, I, there was, there was a ton of litigation, unfortunately, in the patent litigation side. Mm. And my involvement in the patent litigation didn't go away, and my obligation to be a witness didn't go away just because I was no longer involved with the company. I presume you were compensated for this. No. <laughs> wow. Nope. No, there's no compensation. Under U.S. law, if you're uh, involved, in, uh, involved in these things and you're subpoenaed, you have to, uh, you have to show up. Mm -hmm. And if you're within the jurisdiction of the court, you have to show up to testify at trial if subpoenaed as well. Right. So, uh, so I, I had a bunch of stuff where the patent litigation tied me up, and then there was the litigation on the option side. So for the first couple of years, I, I tried to relax, but I spent a lot of time in litigation. The litigation started to tail off, and so I started to get involved in some angel investing. I thought that'd be fun. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill Davidow sort of warned me that it might be fun, but it might not be lucrative or profitable, and he was right. <laughs> so then I got involved with some uh, venture-backed boards, uh, okay. Benchmark Capital and, and others. 
some of the VCs I knew invited me onto some boards. And I found a couple other boards. Uh, so I found that a lot more interesting. There were higher quality companies and better management teams and so forth. And Benchmark and uh, MDV asked me to consider joining the board of NanoSolar. And, and said, and you know, we're thinking about changing CEOs and maybe you could be the temporary CEO as well. So I, I fell for the old temporary CEO <laughs> trick. And when I took over NanoSolar, there was, the board knew there was problems, that's why they wanted to change CEOs, but the problems were so much worse than the board realized that uh, it was very hard to get out of being temporary CEO when mm -hmm. things what were What was NanoSolar doing? What was that Oh, sorry, NanoSolar was, uh, had developed a, uh, uh, technology for making flexible thin film solar mm. panels uh, using something called SIGs, a certain metal stack up, um, and, and, plate, and depositing it on a flexible <coughs> substrate, although they ended up putting it then between solid pieces of glass, so the fact it was flexible was a curiosity, but <laughs> didn't have any value in the end the product. And the whole solar space back at that time, around 2010, was hot and interesting. A lot of money was going into green and clean, you know, of all sorts mm -hmm. of kinds of things. So it seemed like an exciting area. A lot of semiconductor people were getting into it because there's certain elements of manufacturing which are similar. Right. Uh, although I'm not a manufacturing expert. Um, so I said, hey, it would be interesting. I was really not planning to be CEO, but I ended up running it for almost two years. And we ended up selling off the business to a Swiss firm. And then uh, the solar business got into a gigantic oversupply basis. So all the startups in Silicon Valley got wiped out. Yeah. Um, Including a famous one on the other side of the bay, yeah, Solyndra. Solyndra, right, <laughs> right, right. So, so it was interesting. In, in the end, what I realized is that uh, if you think DRAMs are a commodity, you, you haven't been in the <laughs> solar business. <laughs> all you're producing with solar panels is electrons. Yeah. And electrons are all exactly the same. So there's no differentiation. It's just return on investment. Mm -hmm. It's and you and you're selling to ultimately utilities. So if you think, you know, the customers that you sell DRAMs to are large and bureaucratic, try selling solar panels. And they want stuff to work for thirty years in the sun and the rain and the snow and the ice storms. So the reliability challenges are gigantic. Mm -hmm. And um, when I took over the nanosolar, there was a shortage of solar. But once the shortage ended, the customers were like, well, this is a new technology, so we'd be willing to, to buy it after you have five years of reliability data. <laughs> <laughs> it was really, really, really hard for a startup to be able to afford yes. to do. So uh, it, was a, it was a tough business. Um, was, were the issues technical or were they much more market driven? Uh, the, the issues that NanoSolar had were primarily organizational. Ah. The, there was a whole bunch of PhDs with no organization structure and they'd raised $400 million and they were in the process of wow. pissing it away at a rapid rate. Um, underneath that there was technical issues mm -hmm. <laughs> as well. But the biggest issue was organizational so it was a it, it re reconfirmed why I do startups from scratch, which is it's easier to get it right at the you start. You create your own disorganization. Try, try, trying, to, trying to fix problems takes way more energy than oh, yeah. doing it right in the first place. Yep, <laughs> I've seen that too. So you did that for a couple of years, and then uh, understand you're now involved with a programmable logic company of some kind. Tell me about it. Yeah, well, I... Uh, once, once I escaped from NanoSolar, I went back to doing venture-backed boards. And uh, you know, being on a board's a, a good alternative to being CEO, but it's not the same. You, know, you give advice and people are free to ignore it. Yep. Um, you know, and I was on the other side, so I, I know how that works, so I'm okay with that. But um, I, I hadn't planned to go back and be a full-time CEO, although I would get calls repeatedly for people to, who wanted somebody to do this or to do that or to do those. But uh, not, nothing that was ever exciting enough because there's a lot of ways, there's a lot of companies that uh, need management, but there's not very many companies that are worth putting all that effort into. 
you need a special alignment of things to, and mm -hmm. everyone likes different stuff, so I like a certain type of company as well. So, uh, and I was having a good time, you know, finally all the lit litigation had been done, you know, that was all behind me. Uh, we were learning Spanish, we were traveling the world, started to have grandkids, and so I noticed four years ago that my wife was starting to shoot down my ideas about travel, you know, because, well, why would we travel when we have a grandkid? And, and, and Colleen will say, no, 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 it wasn't like that, but that's my recollection of it. And at about that time, one of the VCs I know from uh, Everspin, I'm on the board of a company called Everspin that does mag magnetic memories. Like a lot of VCs, I'd get calls from time to time from them. They'd say, hey, I was talking to XYZ, why don't you go meet with them, see what you think, let me know, is this worth spending any time on? And usually I'd have a lunch or a breakfast and I'd come back and tell them the 10 reasons why it won't work. Um, but in this case, uh, the young guy that I met and, and the professor who was working with him, um, he was a, this was UCLA PhD who had finished up and was doing post-grad work up at uh, Stanford, but really he was trying to start a company based on some technology he had developed with his professor at UCLA. And the name of the person is? Uh, Chen Wang. Chen, okay. And the professor is Dayan Markovich. And, um, you know, after, I can't say that it was after the first meeting, but after a few meetings, I started to go, you know, this kind of feels like uh, Rambus. You know, I'm, you know, he, his idea was I, I can make a better FPGA. I can make an FPGA that's half the size, die area, compared to his Eilinx and Altera. And asking lots of questions, I started to become convinced that he was probably right. Maybe he did know how to do that. But I told him the problem is that I'm not an FPGA expert, but I said, based on what I do know is those companies are $6 billion a year of revenue. You have nothing. Nobody wants to put money into semiconductors these days. Like, semiconductors are getting some interest now, but four years ago, total dead. Mm -hmm. Nobody wanted to put any money in. So I said, even if, even if this was a good business idea, I don't know if we could raise the money. But... But if we could raise the money and we build something that's half the area of die size, the problem is, the biggest first problem is the TSMC's wafer price to Xilinx is going to be half or less of the wafer price you pay, so all of your economic advantage is gone. You only have an advantage if, if it's all other things being equal, but it's not right. being equal. Little companies have huge headwinds they have to sail into, and you're not going to get around them. Plus, you need all these high-speed IOs, and there's packaging, and there's software, and so if you want to do FPGA chips, good, goodbye and good luck. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to work. But it seemed like he actually had some technical advantages. And he seemed like a really sharp guy and, and as the PhDs go, easy to work with. And I was starting to feel like maybe I need a new hobby because <laughs> uh, traveling and, and stuff was maybe not going to stay on the horizon as much. Uh, and I always had a nagging feeling with Rambus that you know, unfinished business. Things didn't work out the way we wanted with all the DDR litigation and the option litigation and all that stuff. You know, the company should have been worth $20 billion. Like $2 billion is not bad. That's better than most people do. But, you know, it's like, well, maybe we try this again. And so we brainstormed and we figured out, well, why not an IP block? Why not do an FPGA IP block? And it seemed like a novel idea. Of course, as it turned out that people had done it for, people had tried for 20 years. In fact, John East, one of my early bosses at AMD, he ran Actel. I took him out to pick his brains about FPGA and he laughed when I said we we're gonna do FPGA's and IP block. He said they tried to do that in the 90s when Rambus was right. starting to do semiconductor <laughs> IP. But um, uh, anyways, uh, I got the sense that, hey, maybe there's something there. We talked to some customers, we saw some interest. And because Chen had done all this work before, he'd done five different FPGA chips. For a small amount of money, we were able to fund the company and get to a point where we had working silicon, working software, and sign up the first customer. Hmm. Something we could never have done if we were doing a chip approach. We would need, we'd have we needed 20 times more money right. to do chips. So as a semiconductor IP play, it was able to be financed uh, and the, the VC who'd introduced me ended up coming in and we did the first round of investment. Um, and then once we signed a customer, we were able to get more investment. 
and now we've raised about $13 million in an A round and a B round, and we're signing up more customers, and it looks like we'll be able to make this market work. What is unique about the function? It's certainly you said size, chip area. Well, there's nothing unique. Uh, what ARM does isn't unique, yeah. for example. It, right. This isn't like Rambus where nobody has ever done it before. Mm -hmm. people, have, people have done FPGA for a long time. Right. Uh, people have tried embedded FPGAs since Actel. Mm -hmm. And as it turns out, we probably ran into a dozen different examples of people who've tried over the years. What I think is different this time is that with Chen's invention, which is a better interconnect, and FPGA is mostly not programmable logic, is mostly the programmable interconnect, right. that we can make the internet denser uh, so we have less area compared to competitive alternatives, but more importantly, we also use fewer layers of metal. So at 28 nanometers, we use six layers of metal. Um, the chips that use us may have 10 layers of metal, but what's important is that you have to be compatible with all the metal stack ups. If our solution was 10 layers of metal, we wouldn't be compatible with all the different metal th thicknesses and widths that people use. The first five, six layers of metal are common and then things change. So you have to be able to implement IP in the bottom five, six layers of metal if you want to be compatible. If you're not compatible, your market starts to shrink. So is it a static RAM based cell or? Uh, it's a 6T configuration memory bit. Okay. You know, and remember, I'm not the engineer, so. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's not a static RAM. Uh -huh. um, and, and it's logic design rules. But anyways, um, what our, our real competitive advantage is that we have, dense, we have higher density and less metal layers than, okay. than if somebody else was to try to do it mm -hmm. because of Chen's inventions. He ended up winning the ISSCC Outstanding Paper Award he and the professor and another okay. UCLA engineer. Uh -huh. so, so it turns out you know, he did come up with something pretty impressive. Sure. So, um, but the, the timing is also right because the costs of masks is accelerating. Mm -hmm. So the ability to make chips be more flexible to get a better return on investment is attractive to people. Whereas at 180 nanometers, mask costs were relatively small. So there was less pressure there. So I'm not quite sure what's different about us from what other people have done, but it's not very clear what the other people did, so it's hard to know mm -hmm. how different we are. Right. But the concept of FPGA is just like ARM. ARM didn't have a new concept, it was just, right. we can put it inside your chip. Yep. And other people had processors that go in chips, but ARM was able to provide a better processor at better economics than their competitors. And I think the idea of an embedded FPGA is not new, but with our interconnect density advantages, our metal advantages, the timing and perhaps our execution, we're able to deliver a solution that checks off all the boxes people need, mm -hmm. whereas mm -hmm. other people apparently weren't able is to. Is there a particular kind of customer or a particular application? Or is it just very general purpose? It turns out it's probably, it's very general purpose. Mm -hmm. um, there are applications where we see a lot of activity. Networking, uh, there's a, a, the networking business is shifting from enterprise networks to data center networks. And the data centers, people like Microsoft have, have written about how the data center protocols for, for uh, uh, security, for um, uh, packets, for, uh, in, for, for storage, all need to become programmable. They want to build data centers where they can change the, the protocols that the data centers run on programmably, rather than have to change hardwired chips whenever they want to add new packet formats. Yeah. And I think within I the data the centers, they're going to optimize sorry. things differently than outside the data centers. You know, yeah. the standards, standards are good, but the data centers are getting so big, the data center is a whole ecosystem to itself. So yeah. I think with programmable protocols, they can optimize things to work better within the data center where, as opposed to hardwired stuff based on worldwide standards. Sure. So that's forcing the networking people to look at ways to, to do this program building a processor is too slow to handle programmability at, the, at line speeds um, in switches and then NIC chips and so forth. 
Another sector is uh, defense electronics. Uh, the aerospace defense people buy something like 10 percent of all FPGAs. They love them. But um, when you're putting stuff up in airplanes or in missiles, size, weight, power, all are very important. FPGA chips, if you can integrate them, the size goes down, the weight goes down, the power goes down, the performance goes up. Mm -hmm. Plus, we can implement for things that go into space, rad hard FPGAs, which you can't buy today. Plus, if you're a defense guy and you're worried about security of supply, we can implement our stuff in US-based fabs, whereas all FPGAs today are built in fabs in Asia. Well, most chips are built in fabs in Asia. Right. <laughs> it's not just FPGAs. <laughs> right. so, so that's giving us a lot of traction in the mm -hmm. defense aerospace arena. There's other segments, microcontrollers, uh, deep learning, but it looks to me like this technology potentially could become pervasive. If it becomes pervasive, then this will be bigger than Rambus was. What stage is the company at now? Oh, we're still early stage. Mm -hmm. we're, we're not at the stage where we have the breakout high volume Nintendo 64. On the other hand, everything works technically. Uh, everything's worked technically since one year into the company. Mm -hmm. uh, the nice thing about this is that we're more like an arm and not like a Rambus. At Rambus, we had to get all those chip companies to agree to jump at right. the same time. Yep. And there's all sorts of price competition issues and so forth. This is more like ARM. We go in their chip. We make their chip more flexible, but it doesn't affect any other chip that they buy. So we convince the chip company or the systems company who designs their own chip. And it, there's no other, it's, so it's like ARM. We don't, the cell is easier. We just, we have to convince one person, but we don't have to convince five people. Yeah. And technically it's all digital, so it's not, all this hard, high-speed analog stuff uh, with signal integrity issues like Rambus. Uh, the main challenge is, is just like at Rambus, is risk aversion. Right. People love the idea, and 90% of our meetings end with, just like at Rambus, when somebody else is in high-volume production, <laughs> let us know. That's We'd true. love to use this technology. Yeah. <laughs> but how they don't want to yeah. take the risk themselves. How do you police something like that where it's buried in a chip to make sure that you get paid the royalties you should. You just have to trust them. Um, well, you know, that's, that's an interesting question. That sort of goes back to, so why do we have the problems at Rambus? Um, the, the difference between Rambus and ARM is at Rambus we were forced to teach our, we had, we had customers who were giant compared to ARM's customers. Right. And, the memory interface was, they only had two things to do, the core and the interface. So it was on their strategic list. Whereas if you're using an ARM processor, there's a dozen other things that you care about more. So ARM doesn't make so much money from any one customer that the, that customer wants to go to the effort of mm -hmm. displacing ARM with their own engineering team. So the, the way that you get people to pay your royalties is because they need more stuff from you in the future. They'll honor, th They'll, if, if cu once customers reach a conclusion that, hey, we've learned everything we need to know, we don't need anything more from them, and this is just a matter of us paying for a patent, then they turn it over to the legal department right. <laughs> to figure out how to minimize those costs. Right. Um, if the customer needs something from you to make the next generation chip work, and they don't know how to do it themselves, then then that means they need you, and so they'll keep paying you what they agreed to pay you on the previous deal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's a matter of staying relevant, staying important, having what they need for the next generation, not just what you did for the last generation. I think it's as, as simple as that. You know, ARM, I don't think, even has any patents. Probably not. It's a matter of, so it's just a matter of, you know, okay, the next chip is going to use ARM, and you need a bigger, faster ARM, Right. so you better not piss off ARM. So you better pay them what you agreed to pay. Sure. So I think it's, it's just as simple as that. Good. So how much of your time are you spending on? Oh, I'm working full time. Pretty much as hard as at Rambus. Okay. Uh, the one difference is I, I try to bicycle to work. So it's outgrown, every day and every back. It's outgrown a hobby then. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And a, where is the office? Job. Where, where, where are you located? If you can bike to work, it must be Palo Alto somewhere. Uh, we're actually located, uh, uh, again, within a couple of blocks of San Antonio and El Camino. Okay. <laughs> so um, 
real estate is too expensive in Palo Alto. Yeah. I could bicycle there, but too expensive. And it's getting further away from where most engineers live in Silicon Valley. Yeah, they can't afford to live in that area. And going south of El Camino in San Antonio would take me all day to bicycle too. <laughs> so the, the handshake deal with Chen, my co-founder, was, okay, if I'm going to be CEO, because he had to convince me to do this uh, and, and stop doing all this fun stuff and working full time, <laughs> then I'm, I'm going to need to bicycle to and from work because without bicycling, I'll gain like 30 pounds. That happened at NanoSolar, right, the drive to work. Right. And uh, life's too short to gain that much weight. So, <laughs> uh, so it's going to have to be Mountain View, it's going to have to probably be El Camino in San Antonio, maybe mm -hmm. Castro Street. Mm -hmm. Castro is too expensive, so San Antonio and El Camino. And actually, we started off in a 600-square-foot office, uh, and then when we needed more space, we were looking. There wasn't a lot of space back a year and a half ago. The A-list space in Mountain View was a very short list, and, but one of the addresses was like, well, that's, that address sounds familiar, and sure enough, it was the Rambus building that we were in for the longest period of time. Okay. From like 91 till 2000, we were in a building across from the old DMV. It's still there. So now we got half of the first floor. And it's a great location, very nice office, and it's my lucky building. Yeah, okay, well good. Good luck to you, Jeff. You've uh, come full circle, for sure. Yeah, doing it again. A any thoughts on somebody wanting to start a Young person wanting to get into industry or start a business today, what, what um, advice would you give them? Well, T technology, presumably. Uh, yeah. Well, the most important thing is to to figure out what you like to do and and do it. Mm -hmm. um, if the money's in technology, but you don't like doing technology, then you probably shouldn't do technology. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of people. Uh, in a lot of walks of life, and you don't have to make a lot of money to be happy. But but if you're not happy, it doesn't matter how much money you have. So right. most important thing is to have a great family life and do something for work that makes you feel good about yourself and where you want to go do it every day. And if it happens to make money, that would be good too. So in, in, if you want to make, m if you happen to be lucky enough where what you like to do is technology oriented, <laughs> then that's a great space to be in. I'd say computer science is, is still the right place to be. Mm -hmm. You know, Double E Horowitz complains that uh, he just doesn't see the talent he used to see, that uh, all the sex appeals moved over to programming and biotech and all this kind right. of stuff, so the talent isn't going in. But, of course, that doesn't mean you can't make money and do well if you're good at what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So. I know in the semiconductor space, I know in the computer science space, there's huge opportunities for people and where you will probably want to do is go to a place like Silicon Valley where there's a ton of companies that are growing fast that are willing to give young people a chance and like at AMD have a lack of, it's not like AMD had a lack of management talent, I'm phrasing that wrong, but at a fast growing company, there's like a big suction. Yeah. You know, just a lot of you just, opportunities you just to can't find something. get enough good right. people fast enough. So if there's opportunity, it's easy to work hard and be given it or, or take it by just assuming more 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 work. Mm -hmm. And I remember back at AMD when I joined, it seemed like management was all pretty old, but in retrospect, <laughs> they're, they're all kids, very young. Right. Yeah, I go to semiconductor companies now, and I think about it, and I go, you know. These guys are all like 20 years older than the same management functions at AMD back in the day. So you want to be in a place where there's a lot of fast-growing companies, and you want more than one fast-growing company because you have to have some competitive capability. Any one company may not be the right thing for you. Mm -hmm. So uh, Silicon Valley, I think, is a perfect place. But there's other places in the world, Israel, China, where where the situations exist probably sure. as well.